Today we're going to close the loop a bit and we're going to come back to free energy. Um, so remember when this all started. We started looking at first simple interactions in biomolecules and then we used those interactions to gradually introduce the concepts of entropy. And then we started talking a little bit about free energy. And with that free energy we could then start to say understand the hydrophobic effect, the hydrogen bonds, but we're still talking about fundamental interactions there, right? And then based on that, we took another step and started looking at real biomolecules that we then, more to a smaller or greater extent, could understand with the free energy concepts. And then we even introduced, if you're going to model real biomolecules in simulations or something else, you will probably start doing, you will do that a little bit the last two labs here, in particular related to free energy. But that is not just a one-way street. So you can also use this type of relatively advanced simulations calculations to calculate free energies. Not just for simple things like a hydrogen bond, but for more complicated things, such as binding a molecule. And we touched upon that a little bit yesterday in drug, actually more than a little bit, in drug design. But in drug design, what we have done the last 20 years in this field is to do this fast, fast, fast. Because if we can't do it fast enough, well, okay. we had to do it fast because we were not that accurate. So we had to somehow compensate accuracy with throughput instead so that we could use this to just screen databases. And based on that screening, we then hope to find something. And what I'm going to spend the first half of the lecture today talking about is really the next generation stuff that's coming. What we want to do, computers are now fast enough that we can do this fairly accurately in the simulations. And then I'm going to spend the second half talking a little bit about our research. And the point is, it's not just that I'm a corny professor and like to talk about my own research, but to partly give you a feeling about research projects that go on both in our team and others at SciLife Lab. And I simply, for obvious reasons, I know more about my own research than others. Uh, and then this afternoon, uh, we have recruited a bunch of students from our labs, so that we're going to split you into groups at SciLife Lab and have them talk to you during an hour or two, depending on what you're interested in. But before that, we had the other task for you, that you're going to talk about drug design. And I'm not going to ask you a single question, but you can ask me questions. If you are completely quiet, this is going to be a very awkward 30 minutes. <laughs> So shoot, what did you find interesting, unclear? Um, yep. Um, it's not really about those, but it's, it's when we were talking about doing the, um, the docking, mm -hmm. when you can do millions of, of molecules and see which one binds best or where they mm -hmm. bind, etc. You take the molecules from a database, mm -hmm. but then, I mean, before you design your own, you take them from a database, but when you're searching through the database, do you, do you take all of them or do you first narrow it down to the ones that fit the, the pharmacophore that you found? So, so it, it depends a bit. Um, historically, you would always narrow it down with pharmacophores. Um, but that assumes that you know something about the binding site, right? And as computations have gotten better and better, we are increasingly trying to do, well, I was about to say blind docking. It's not quite blind because I know that this is the likely binding site. But I have no effing idea what will bind there. So just screen everything. And, and the point there is that screening through 100 million compounds, I can do it dock, in docking. It might take a week or so. And then based on that, there is this concept that I didn't tell you about yesterday, but it's called, it's important, it's called refinement factor. And let's see here. So if you start out with a very large database, let's say one million compounds, and we know based on pure statistics that out of that set, let's say that there are, it's the probability of having it being a good binder, let's say for argument's sake that it's in the ballpark of 10 to the minus four. It's completely arbitrary numbers. Uh, so that means that's 10, that one in 10,000, right? So that means that in theory, there should be roughly 100 binders in that binding set. So if I were to pick 1,000 of those molecules and go into the lab, the likelihood that I will have, again, purely randomly, like, the likelihood that I will find a binder is only 1 in 10. That's not very good. And then we might do a docking. And what you, case it, what you think about in terms of docking is how much better are these chances. 
and normally their docking refinement be a fact, might be a factor of 5 or 10 or so. But let's, for argument's sake, say that I have a refact, refinement factor of 100. 100x refinement. So what that would mean that after docking, the likelihood in the high-ranking compounds that I select, the probability would now be a factor 100 better than random. So that out of, the, say, the top 1,000 docking molecules, if it was completely randomly selected, it would be 10 to the minus 4. With this refinement factor, it's still 10 to the minus 2. So the, the, no, but the refinements say that, sorry, the likelihood of a, rand, of a, of a compound here is uh, being a good binder is 10 to the minus 4. Think of docking like a black box. And this black box selects a, another set of molecules. But of course, it's not doing it randomly. But suddenly, after this black box, you have improved this probability by a factor of 100. So that the likelihood of a binder here being good is still just 1%, which is lousy. But the point is that if I now select 1,000 molecules and go into the lab, 1,000 times 1% is going to be, I expect to see on average, 10 binders. So the point is that the actual prediction power of the docking is still lousy, right? It's still out of the molecules, all those 1,000 molecules that I say will be good, it's only 1 in 100 that's going to be good. But because it's 100, a factor 100 better than random, well, 10 out of 100 doesn't, sorry, 10 out of 1,000 doesn't sound good. But the point is, I don't need a thousand good molecules. If I have one good hit, that's enough. But a tenth of a hit is not enough. So that's very much how you think. I accept that 990 out of the test will be crap, because I get 10 good ones. And then I go into the lab, and when I found those 10, I will, of course, discard the other 990. So it's all based on statistics. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so what was a pharmacophore in the first place? <laughs> mm. So given that definition, what would you say? So this is the trick, right, with pharmacophore. We describe the, mole we describe the molecules that bind, which is both the curse and the blessing. The blessing is that describing the entire receptor is difficult. But if I know 10 other small molecules that bind, it's much easier to describe their average properties because they're small. On the other hand, the curse there is that if I don't know what's binding, it's going to be virtually impossible to design a pharmacophore. So you need, either you need a very clear binding site where it's obvious where you're going to need something hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrogen bond donor, or acceptor, or you know 5, 10 other molecules that bind. So based on that, how likely is that scenario? Now I keep asking questions, but sorry, I can't help. Based on that scenario, how likely is it that you start out in the case where you have 10 molecules at mind? If you make a pharmacophore, well, you, to make a pharmacophore, you needed a handful of molecules at mind, right? Um, so I'm. It's a chicken and egg problem here, but let's assume that we're starting out, we want to make a pharmacophore. How likely is it that you know 10 molecules that bind to your receptor? Any other suggestions? <laughs> so think about what I said yesterday. What is the main problem in drug design? Sorry? Right, so it's not a hard, anybody can find a molecule that binds. We can do it almost randomly. And we even saw some of these databases, right, that you had 146 molecules binding. It's trivial to find things that bind. And I would, unfortunately, this is also where a lot of theory goes wrong. Both simulations, free energy, docking, and bioinformatics, that theoreticians, me included, we think that it's so hard to predict that a molecule binds. The hard part is making sure that it doesn't bind in the wrong place, making sure that the admin talks works. Lipinski's rule of five. Um, yeah, it's great that it's binding to your receptor, but if, if the molecule can never get to that receptor because it's not soluble in water, 
or that it's a peptide drug that's going to be digested, it doesn't really help us that it binds there, right? So that binding is not hard. Binding is trivial. So let's come back to these questions and discuss them. Um, but maybe we should structure it a little bit more. Uh, let's assume that you're hired in a research group at SciLife Lab after your thesis project. Uh, <coughs> and this is actually not, this is not just a theory. We have a bunch of research groups that work on very concrete targets, uh, same cancer. And you have in a uh, tyrosine kinase receptor or something that this team is very interested in. How would you go about it? Don't think that this professor is going to tell you exactly what to do because this professor is, his or her specialization is in cancer research. They have no idea about drug design, docking, all this modern stuff. That's why they're hiring you. So how would you get started? They have receptor X that they are interested in. X marks the spot. Talk to them about that with your colleague, the next person. Um, well, you can have a team of three there. Spend three minutes talking about that, and then uh, we're going to see how good you are at this, whether you're going to get fired or... <laughs> <laughs> So I'll give, you, I'll give you one more slash clue slash instruction to think about. The one thing that this research group has found out is that this receptor or whatever protein it is, there's a mutant in it. And it's this mutation that is somehow causing this disease. That's all you know. So get that based on what we said earlier. Don't jump too far ahead. Take a step back and think what the actual problem is and what you need to think. The only thing you know is that there's a mutation in that protein and that is somehow causing tumor growth. So we can answer all the details too, but again, don't jump straight to the details. Yes. <laughs> 
Should we discuss it a bit? I hear some good ideas. <laughs> so you're now hired, and we're sitting at this group meeting. It's a large, likely a large group. They likely have 30 people in the room or something. And they, we need to brainstorm. What should we do? So that, and this is important, right? Uh, don't even think about structure yet. The first thing you need to understand is biology. Uh, and this might sound obvious, but there is so much high throughput research right, that you're only looking at four nucleotide bases on screens. And that yes, you can certainly find patterns there. You can do whole genome analysis and realize all these patients have mutation in this particular gene. But that's not gonna get you anywhere unless you understand the biology. What is it doing, why? So how could you understand the biology? <laughs> if you if you know you know the mutation, right? That is it's in it. position three hundred and ninety four. <laughs> Alanine <laughs> to valine. Um, yes. I, I, ju I just made that up. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you could do uh, make some some cells that express the mutant protein and see what's going on compared to the yeah, uh, they grow tumors. You can certainly do that. Uh, we don't, unfortunately, that's actually a course we don't have in the program, sadly. Um, so there are certainly th uh, things like super resolution, microscopy and everything. The problem with that is that both that and growing these specific cells that typically require you to have cell lines and everything specific, individual cells that express this. Um, and you can certainly do that, I, I bet the large group would do. But there are things you can do already on the bioinformatics level. That are also that you, haven't, you didn't explicitly study that in the bioinformatics course, but it's related to these networks. You can see what other proteins is this protein interacting with. And there are, there are databases, for instance, have you heard about KEG, for instance? So there are databases of pathways, metabolism. And not that you care about the sequences, right? But where in the metabolic pathways is this protein present? And it might be, if it's, a, that it's, a, if it's a tyrosine kinase, we know exactly where it is, right? But in general, you need to understand, out of all the molecules in this class, exactly what is this protein doing. So, then let's assume that we are there, and we do know uh, the biology, and we do know the two, three interaction partners this protein has, and we, you might even have a hunch what's happening in this process. So what's the next step? Mm, on, the, on the other hand, if there were other drugs that worked on a very related protein, we would likely not be doing the research, right? So that we don't have any drugs. We, have, we still don't. Remember, the only thing we do know, we know roughly where in the metabolic pathway this protein is. See how it's affecting the other partners? Exactly. Um, and then this affecting the other partners, that's a bit fussy, right? But it, it's, it's whatever is happening in this pathway, are we too active or not active enough? The likelihood, the likelihood that mutations create a completely new function, it's unlikely. Uh, in theory, it can happen. But what virtually always happens is that, sorry, if the function of a protein was completely altered, the organism, the human, would likely die. 
But so the reason why it's only creating disease is that something is either too active or not active enough. Let's say that it's too active. It's upregulating. What can you say from that? Oh, we sometimes use pluses too. For some reason, something is severely upregulated here. Right. Um, Maybe find out what domain that uh, mutation is at to understand how it makes it more active. Conversely, if it's severely downregulated, what would we need to do? It had to do with these classes of drugs we talked about, right? So what type of drug do you need in this case versus that case? Mm -hmm. Then we need an inhibitor to kill it. Partial or full agonist, right? So we need to create, for whatever reason, your body is not activating this receptor well enough. So you need to add some molecules that activates the processor, which the body does not do. And that's why I actually... I, might poss I should possibly have emphasized that better yesterday. But that is why this concept, because the concepts are going to be completely different whether you want to destroy a process or enhance it. It's far easier, in general, it's far easier to destroy things uh, than to create things. And most drugs we have tend to be inhibitors. There are gradually more and more agonists. Uh, and they're the simplest agonists you can imagine. What type, what would, what would, well, a simple agonist at least. What would you try to, what strategy would you follow there? There's kind of two paths. Either we need to destroy the process or we need to enhance it. If you need to enhance the process, maybe you can find a drug that binds similar to the, to the natural molecule that binds to the receptor, mm -hmm. but that binds better. Or so that's, that's certainly one possibility. So get, finding something that works exactly the same way. No, I think. Now this is a bit of a trick question because there was something I did not mention in the slide yesterday. Agonists, by agonists, well, normal agonists, they should bind in the same place. Are there other types of drugs you can imagine? I mentioned it a few lectures ago. You can find allosteric drugs, right? So maybe, maybe there is something that goes wrong inside the protein machinery. So can I somehow add a drug that binds in a completely separate binding site, but that somehow rescues this functionality? And the reason for that is that this process, for instance, let's assume that it's, that it's not gated by a ligand. It could be a voltage-gated channel, right? I can't increase the voltage in the cell. And the voltage, that's not really a binding site. But maybe I can create a drug that somehow helps the voltage activation. And we, when it's in terms of drugs, we usually call those agonists too. It will have the same effect. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the process itself was activated by a drug. And so we're here. Uh, remember, let's get back to our receptor X. What, what do you need to do in the team? Let's have some of the other groups answer questions too. What would the entire team do? That's whether it's an agonist, uh, sorry, whether, whether it's an inhibitor you would like to get or an agonist you would like to get. All we know is that there is a mutation in this site that is related to regulation and it's our pet protein. So we're two weeks later, sitting in the group meeting and brainstorming. We know more than two weeks ago, but to get there, what do we need? Maybe you can check in some databases what molecules binds to this receptor and try to make like this unlucky. Yeah, but I said that we were unlucky. We don't know anything that binds to it yet. We're going to need the structure at some point. Because we're fumbling in the dark here. All we know that there is a mutation somewhere in the long sequence, and we hardly have any idea what the protein is doing. Right? How can we get a structure? 
that's the right answer. And why do, why, why do you think that I would have been upset if you had not said homology models? Because if I said X-ray crystal, Yes, then it would cost. <laughs> we can do an X-ray crystal, but it's going to cost you $1 million. Uh, and yes, we can do that if we absolutely have to. But if this protein had 70% residue sequence, that your PI would kill you if he realized that you could have done this in an afternoon rather than spend a million dollars. Actually, it's not so much the million dollars that matters. It might take two years to get that X-ray crystal. And it's, there is no question that you're, sorry, say your homology model is not going to be as good. But the homology model we can have tomorrow afternoon. And it's not strictly homology model, right? But in general, any type of comparative modeling, protein structure prediction, as you learned in the bioinformatics course, is starting to be scarily good. It used to be that they would laugh at you if you tried to do drug design with homology models, but that's no longer the case. But let's assume that your model is not that good. <laughs> then you need to do, get a structure. Um, and how, what would you do if you had to get a structure here? A real structure, experimental one. So the first thing is that you should not do it yourself. Find a partner. Find a collaborator group who's really good at structure determination. And this is what happens. So that this big cancer research group at SciLife Lab would now say, maybe call my colleague uh, David Drew or somebody here to see, could they help you determine a structure? Because they're not, you're not, your own team is not an expert in determining the structure, and you don't want to wait four years. So you say cryo EM. Um, that's certainly one alternative. Are there other alternatives? X-ray. So there are advantages and disadvantages with both of these. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about them this afternoon during the study visit. What's the big and you might, it might, I like cryo-EM in many ways, but it's certainly not the universal method. What is the advantage of cryo-EM? You can remember stuff. No, no residue. But that's not an advantage. Cryo-EM is easier for most It's fast. You don't, we don't need as much protein. If you can produce your protein, we might be able to get some information about this in a month or two months. Uh, the bad thing is exactly what you say. The resolution can be lousy. And even, even the structures that those of us who do cryo-EM are ecstatic about, they're so amazingly good. Three angstrom resolution. By X-ray standards, that's a lousy structure. At three angstrom resolution, so what is, if you're thinking about the hydrogen bonds resolution, to get these things right, the distance between a hydrogen and a carbon is roughly one angstrom. In a hydrogen bond, the difference in position between the oxygen and the nitrogen is 3.5 angstrom. If you have three angstroms resolution, and that's the average resolution in the structure, what is going to the quality of your binding site going to be? So in many cases, the quality of a cryo-EM structure is in the ballpark of an homology model. I so wish that was not true, but it is true in general. The other problem is that cryo-EM frequently can't determine structures of small things. So I hope, wish, and pray that things are going to be different in 10 years, and I, I think they likely will. But for now, there are very few, if any, cases where cryo-EM has been used successfully in drug design. You might be able to see roughly where a drug binds, and we're developing these techniques. I so hope that we can change it, but for now, you will likely need to go to X-ray. Because if you have a good x-ray group, they're going to give you a 1.5 angstrom structure. And this might not sound like a big deal, but the point is at 1.5 angstrom, you're going to see all the sites, all the atoms. You see everything. So with that binding site, we know, we know everything we want about the binding site. So a bit boring, but sadly, this is still the norm. So what I would do, I might very well call one cryo -EM group and one x-ray group. Uh, or David Drew, who is doing both, because then they can overexpress the protein. You're going to need a factor of 10 more protein for X-ray. But I would ask them, let's try to crystallize it and see what happens. Because if we're lucky and we get good crystals, take them down to the synchrotron in Lund, and then we might get an X-ray crystal in a few months. On the other hand, in six months, when they are still struggling and they can't get the crystals to grow, having a cryo structure is a whole lot better than nothing. 
and Marta might cry a bit if I told that, but well, no, she knows about it. Um, okay, now you have a structure. Um, we're s six months later into the project now because that took a while. But, the, but, no, but, the, but the, and this is important, right? That drug design does not happen overnight. These are very large campaigns and groups. And in, in some cases, it can take more than the length of a PhD to target a new receptor. Because if this is successful, we're going to be able to cure new forms of cancer. Yeah, I have a structure. What do you do? Sorry? <laughs> Sorry. Well, you can't really patent the structure. Why can't you patent the structure? That's actually a very good question. Why can't you patent the structure? So that to be able to patent something, it has to have technical effect, and it has to be an invention. Uh, and it should not be an obvious combination of two results. So the fact that uh, uh, an obvious is a bit sliding. Um, I actually worked at the patent office uh, when I was a student over summer. Let's, let's come up with a really stupid invention. Um, when you're doing the dishes and you need a brush, right? Why should you hold that brush? Can't we invent some, like, take a glove and then put lots of brushes on the glove? So then you can just put on the glove and, and then do the dishes with the glove. That sounds like a cool invention. Do you think I could patent that? That, my friends, is a class in the patent system. There are like 500 patents in that class. <laughs> Just because things are not sold on the market doesn't mean that somebody didn't patent them 50 years ago. A patent is not a guarantee that it's a good or a smart product or that anybody will want to buy your product. So in practice, the thresholds for patenting things is fairly low. What we do say is that you're not allowed to patent the result. By, you're not, I'm not allowed to patent the sound because it's not my invention. It's something that exists in nature. Just that I discover something doesn't mean that I can patent it. But there are a couple of examples. Have you heard about Myriad Genetics? Have you heard about this? Did you hear about this in the bioinformatics course? BRCA? Yeah. So what is that? It's a horrible breast cancer gene. So that if you have this gene, it's only a matter of time. You will develop breast cancer. Uh, and that's why th there have been a number of celebrities and everything that you do preventive mastectomy, you remove the breasts. Uh, you might even uh, remove the womb by the time you've had kids in the 30s or so because to prevent you from getting breast cancer. So how do we, how do we know that you have this gene? A gene that does. A myriad genetics patented the gene. And then they sold the test at the cost of only $50,000. They have a patent on the gene, so you're not allowed to develop a competing test. This has made its round through the courts in the US, and I think what eventually happened, this was eventually turned down in the Supreme Court, that they cannot patent the gene. But what people try to do, you patent the techniques by which you sequence this particular gene, or you try to patent all the details about this specific test. So it's the same strategy. Create a bomb carpet, make it very difficult for somebody. But formally, you can't patent the gene. You can't patent the sequence. You can't patent the protein if it's naturally occurring. Because you have the right to your DNA, even if you share my sequence. I can't patent, uh, I can't patent sequences of your DNA. In theory, at least. Uh, so you can't patent the protein. Sorry. And we're still sitting here with our structure, and your PI is starting to get a bit irritated because you just spent a million dollars on the x-ray structure, <laughs> and we just have a structure. We're not closer to any drug. That's, that's a good idea. Um, and ideally, what we likely did when we sequenced this protein, right, that you probably took both the wild type and the mutant and tried to determine the structure of both of them at the same time. Uh, so let's assume we did that. Uh, but it's actually it's a very good strategy. If you didn't do that, you could, if you have the structure of the wild type, right, getting, now making the homology model and predicting the effect of that single site mutation, that's something that the computer should be really good at because you have like 99% sequence identity. You could even do a simulation and try to understand what this specific mutant does. Um, let's assume that it changes something in the pocket here. Um, so we have the binding pocket, whatever. Let's say that this is the wild type. 
And then we have the mutant that it will look different. It's a valine instead of alanine. So it's a different shape in the pocket. Maybe you can do a docking on the computer to see, to see whether that, mutage, or that change in the pocket um, makes the affinity higher or lower for mm -hmm. the natural. So now I might have jumped a little bit here, but, but assuming that this was some protein that the activity was too low, right? Can you guess what might have happened here? before we start talking. Yes? It gained for other Either it gained affinity to other molecules or the molecule that normally would bind here is now too large to fit or something. So that for whatever reason, the, nor the molecule that would normally activate this receptor can't really bind there anymore because we've, the binding site has changed a bit. So we're saying that the activity was down. Yes, or, or the opposite. Uh, the other alternative, if it was upregulated, it could of course have been that because this has changed, there would now be too many smaller molecules binding or something, but something has changed in the binding properties here. And again, your first bet should be, even if you don't know what the binding site is, when you have a structure, you know where on the molecule this mutation happened. And the first your first strategy should of course be to look at that region. The likelihood that there is something on the other side of the protein that's changed is nil. And then you mentioned some strategy. What uh, is that you wanted to do here? Docking, yes. Uh, so at this point, you start doing what you call, and docking, there is another abbreviation for that that I actually, I told you about it, but I didn't tell you the abbreviation. You will occasionally see that. What does that stand for? I said it yesterday. I didn't, I didn't spell, I didn't say that. I didn't tell you about the abbreviation. So what does HTS stand for? High, High throughput screening. And the V stands for virtual. So because traditionally you might do this in the lab, right? But the virtual means that we do it in the computer. And the virtual high throughput screening we do by docking. And then we do exactly the thing that we told you. That start from a million molecules. Uh, if there's one database I had to pick, I would pick zinc. Zinc is not commercial. If you run a large pharmaceutical company, and let's say that you are, if a large pharmaceutical company that's specializing on cancer, they likely have their own internal molecular databases with a million drugs that they know that they tend to be important for these receptors. Do you think they will share these databases with researchers? Well, so that, do you think they will make them public? No. Because this database is stuff that you can patent. They likely have a patent on every single molecule in this database. So this is something they want to hold close to the chest. On the other hand, pharmaceutical companies, they only have limited manpower inside the company and everything. So they would likely like to work together with researchers. So at this point, what can you do if you're in this research team? You can contact them, right, and say that you would like to collaborate with them. Uh, and they might, at this point, you might some, get some sort of agreement. The research group should probably make very clear that they own the right to the drug and everything, but maybe the pharmaceutical company can help you screen. Because in the first round, maybe you didn't find anything in this open free database, but they can also test their drugs. And if you're then going to publish that, you're not going to publish the structure of those drugs. So then you can say that you tested this on all of sync and you found these 10 hits. And then you also tested it on, or you might not even include that in the paper. So, or, or you might say that you had this other database and there were four compounds named A to F. But you're not going to tell for now what those compounds are because you're going to try to patent them. Why can't you first publish and then patent? You're only allowed to get a patent for things that have not yet, are not yet known. So you need to submit the patent application before you submit the publication. Good, let's say that you found five hits here and they have some reasonable binding affinity. What do you do? Mm, yes, well, is there something you want to do before you head to in vitro screening, maybe? Or actually, no, you're probably right, but uh, you might, 
it makes sense that you, you want to test them. Um, but, but I said that when we found five, let's say that we found the docking selected 1,000. When I tested this in the lab, I found five good ones, or five ones that had some sort of effect on the receptor. What do we need to do by these, with these five? Well, long before simulation. In general, if I don't tell you anything, how good do you think those are going to be? Exactly right. They're like, in general, they're hardly going to show. It's just 95. It's just one, slightly outside of the standard deviation. So there is some sort of significance here, but it's not very strong. But it's the best you have. Alter them. How do you? How would you alter them? And there are, we mentioned a couple of different strategies to this, right? But this is all optimization pace. So now we had some hits. So hit just means that we found something that works. Um, and now we're in this phase where we call lead optimization. So the, the hit, the hit is now something that we want to. Liter it's literally a lead, a clue that we want to iteratively improve, and try to get. Can we get it to be better than just so slightly significant to be something that is a really good binder? How would you do this? Well, the first thing that's again something I didn't you would like to contact some organic chemists, say upstairs here. People who are really good at designing molecules. And it might, for instance, the solubility of your molecule might be too low. Can we improve the solubility? You ask the organic chemist to help you with that. And then you get some new molecules, and then you try them again. And you might even use some computers. Even some, you might more or less randomly try to add or remove small groups on the molecules. And this, of course, experience counts. And there is even an entire field called, it, called medicinal chemistry. And that's really when you try to alter the chemistry of small molecules. This might take you a year to gradually improve it. But at the end of this year, let's see, if you have some sort of plot, if this was wild type, you might have started out here. That's something that was just so slightly significant. And then after a year, we have a gigantic, very strong signal. It's very significant. It's a good binder and everything. What do you do here? Before you go to clinical trials, which is called preclinical, right? Uh, so you do animal tests. But at this point, the research is almost over. At this point, things start to become, so until this stage, it's cheap. And now it starts to be quite expensive. Because you don't want to run an animal facility, trust me. Uh, so at this point, you're going to need other teams involved. Actually, the, the, the animal tests will likely be done in this large research group, but with somebody who's an expert on testing this in mice. Why do you use mice? Cheaper and it's cheap, fast, right? Um, and we don't need that many permits. I think I already mentioned this joke to you that, that <laughs> if you're a mouse and get cancer, we have very good treatment for you. Um, and at some point, there might be some more iterations here. You might want to try to remove some toxicity. You might try to, but the point, you can't change things too much. Because that you, if you start to take steps back here, you're going to need to redo everything you did. So it's not strictly a one-way street. So at, at, the, at the animal testing, you might still want to try to improve, or you might have 10 candidate molecules. And based on these 10 candidate molecules, slight variations, you might end up picking two, or maybe three, possibly even just one. What do you do with that one molecule? So the first thing you do is actually read what you say. Here's the patent. So now you, that you've shown that this molecule works, it has a technical effect on something. Now you patent it before you submit the publication. The second thing you do, you would likely create a small startup. So why would you create a small startup? And it's, well, it's also, it starts to get very expensive now, right? The likelihood that you will be able to afford the next steps in academia is fairly low. So you create a small startup, and then you approach a couple of people, uh, say venture capitalists, and everything. Say so you would need to take this through clinical trials here, and this is going to cost you a lot of money. 
and then they invest in this. This is super high risk investments. It's another famous quote by Peter Lynch, who is the famous, very famous stock investor and everything. He used to, he used to the one type of company he never invested in was uh, biotechnology or med uh, medical startups because they say that there were 100 PhDs, 99 microscopes because there's one CEO and it doesn't have a microscope and zero profits. Because the problem is you're not, you, you don't have any income whatsoever in the company. You have nothing to sell. But you're going to need to spend $10 million to take this through testing. So, they, so why would people be stupid enough to invest in a company like this? If it works, it's 100 billion, right? Uh, so that it's super high risk investment that they even know that on average they're going to lose their money. But one company out of 10 is going to work so well that they get it back. What typically happens today is that it used to be the fact that the big pharmaceutical companies bought them with your patent or something here. What typically happens today is that they are too conservative and they know that there are so many things that fail. So on the very first stage, you typically have researchers, maybe some funding from an innovation agency, maybe some external capitalist. You typically take things through phase one yourself or in the small company. What was phase one? Healthy people. You always it doesn't kill you, hopefully. Um, and then somewhere in f during phase two, or at least when you start getting the first phase two results, that might be where a larger company buys you. So what was phase two? To patients. Mm. patients, and you need to show that it actually has an effect. The other thing, when you're testing things in phase one, you might have a few dozen patients or so. So they still cost money because you're going to need the regulatory paperwork is quite intense. You're going to need doctors on board and everything. You need lots of permits. Uh, you need to, the money you're paying to the, say the students or something is a very small cost. But getting all the medical staff involved starts to cost money. But that's still doable. Why is phase two so much more expensive than phase one? So, well, how do you convince the doctors or it's so much the regulatory agencies? What is it that they want? Okay. They want statistics, right? So in phase two, you're going to probably going to need at least a factor of 10 more subjects, maybe a factor of 20 more subjects. And that also means that it's going to cost you 20 times more money because now you're going to need you're going to need to test this in different parts of the world. Um, um, you're going to need to say that if you take is, does this drug work in men, in women, et cetera? Uh, young, old people, again, there's lots of statistical requirements. And now this star, cost starts to go up and your $10 million you had in startup funding is depleted in your company and you can't take it any further. And at this point, you frequently have a medium-sized company that comes in and say that we will buy your entire company for $50 million. This is a pretty good turnover, right? That you, the investment might have been $5 million and now they're buying you for $50 million. But they want you as researchers in so that they basically, they buy the entire company and the stuff. This something called acquihire. You actually, it's just as much the staff as the drug you're buying. But they buy all your patents and everything. This company would then take this to phase three. And phase three would what? And you need to show that it's better, right? You can imagine the statistical requirements are now even higher. So it's another factor of 10 more expensive. And what frequently happens in phase three is that this medium-sized fish gets bought by an even larger fish. And then you have uh, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and they might now spend a billion dollars on your company because this looks promising. That, of course, the second the phase three is ready, the second this drug is approved, right, it's too late because then you, have, then you can take it to market. So they they frequently look at the statistics and look, everything here looks so good. So we think it's very likely that this company will succeed. So we'll buy it now while they're cheap. So what's increasingly happened that more and more development happens in the quite small companies and in particular in academia. And that's why this is not a fake example. You will, quite a few of you might where we'll start working in case like this. Um, one problem here is that, one problem here is actually that Throughout all this testing, um, 
Pharma, pharma, big pharma is frequently criticized. So one thing that they're frequently criticized for is that there are more drugs that are developed for male diseases or that there are better indications for men. So for instance, anything that's related to um, congestive heart failure or something, we frequently test it better on men than on women. Why? Well, no, the, well, th there's somewhat related to this, in, the, in particular in the early stages. There because the mice are male. Well, we can certainly test it in female mice too. Uh, they're both female and male mice the last time I checked. <laughs> but there, 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 is one prob there is one problem in this early testing that we haven't solved. Because there are, as we mentioned before, there are dangers with drugs. And there is something that don't happen to men that can happen to women. Pregnancy. Pregnancy. And the problem is in those rare cases when something goes wrong, right? Actually, it's not, we're not talking about the healthy subject, the patients and everything. If something goes wrong, it might cause genetic defects or something in the next generation. And of course, if we give a man a drug and they fall a bit ill, right, we can, we can stop administering the drug. So that what frequently happens is that you first, it, and it's, it's an order of magnitude more difficult to find side effects related to pregnancy, and particularly for the baby. So that's what's frequently happens. We first get the drug approved for the men. And when we see it after two or three years that they don't die, then you might also allow, now because again, we're talking about very small statistical effects, right? And then when we've had the drug on the market two or three years, we might also show that we might also dare to start making larger and larger scale trials on pregnant women. And it's not until you have tested it on pregnant women that you're comfortable giving it to pregnant women. And if you think that this is stupid, think about thalidomide, right? So that we've had some pretty scary things in the history of science with the horrible birth defects and everything caused by drugs. But I think this is roughly how it goes. Uh, it happens all the time. Um, there are tons of new drugs developed. Um, but now we spoke about humans. The problem here is that this process takes 10 years. And a lot of development now is not necessarily this type of drugs. Because if you're a company, as you probably saw here, the risks are pretty high, right? So the traditional way would be to focus on medicine. And there are still a lot of companies doing that. But a lot of development today is what we call biotech instead. And companies tend to prefer biotech, in particular small companies, for a few reasons. So can you imagine anything you would do, like to do in biotech related to understanding binding or something? I spoke a little bit about it at the break yesterday with a few of you. For instance, what if, can you get bacteria to produce ethanol or something? Or terpenes or something? So we, can we produce biofuels in bacteria? then you might need to alter the bacteria a bit. It's not, we're not literally developing drugs against any mutation, right? But we might want to create mutations to get the bacteria to produce something different. Um, something else, you might want to produce a better insecticide or an insecticide that kills the, uh, some sort of insect, but it doesn't hurt bees. It's actually a significant problem now that we, hit, we kill bees with insecticides. And one advantage here is that you can imagine Again, pregnant women on one side versus insects or cockroaches on the other. The requirements when it comes to cockroaches are not quite as high. So that if you have a new insecticide, you might very well be able to go from lab to the market in one year, which beats 10 years. So in general, biotech is nice, because, or you can imagine sort of any type of better product to improve an industrial process or something. The advantage is that you cut the development time in 10, there are no clinical trials with 10,000 patients involved. There are no regular, hardly any regulatory agencies. You would probably need to get the insecticide approved. But again, the requirements are orders of magnitudes lower than patients. So that a lot of small companies today tend to focus on biotech rather than medicine. That's roughly what we had. Is there anything else you want to say about that? Or should we head on to free energies? They can be highly profitable. Um, it depends. There are certainly bad ones too, right? Uh, many biotech companies even might even focus on developing things that are important for the pharmaceutical companies, but it's not the directly the drug. 
One example could be new delivery mechanisms. So can you create some sort of small vesicles that help you deliver the drug to the cancer cell? So we're not developing the cancer drug, but we're developing some sort of vehicle that you can use for hundreds of different drugs to develop them. So they're very profitable. Um, if you look in the Bay Area, for instance, that bio biotech is kind of the new digitalization area. There's a huge amount of things going right to digitalization of life sciences. And it doesn't mean that we turn everything into bioinformatics, but as I mentioned yesterday, we're increasingly having robots steered by Python scripts and everything. We're testing on a very large scale. So it's a, it's, a grow, it's, a, it's a large industry that's growing and it's very profitable. I would even say it's far more profitable than the computer industry because the problem with the computer industry is that things, there is a war that the price war drive also drives the profits towards zero. So it's very hard to make money in computing because you're, in particular, you're competing with Amazon. If you're competing with Amazon, Google, and Facebook, it's hard to make money. Biotech is more of a Klondike with thousands of small companies and many. There are certainly <laughs> quite a few that go bankrupt, but many of them make a lot of money. There was a large scandal in Silicon Valley a few years ago. Um, and I should know the name here, uh, and now it escapes me. But it's basically a new company that proposed that they could develop a broad spectrum of blood tests and using new fancy biotech they could do this with one tenth to one hundredth of the amount of blood. They do very efficient genetic testing and everything. And it turned out to not, it wasn't quite a scam, but these methods never really worked. And eventually the Food and Drug Administration cracked down on this uh, and uh, put them out of business. But for a long time this was one of the hottest companies in Silicon Valley with a valuation of 50 billion dollars or something and now they're, they're bankrupt. Because then the promise that it might, the problem with the valuation of these companies is so much, it's more based on future promise rather than current performance. That if this might be the next cool thing that's gonna put all other companies worldwide out of business and you have patents on all the key technologies, the market goes crazy. On the other hand, it's, it's easy for us to say that on the other, 15 years ago there was a small stupid search company that was started by a couple of students. And I remember because I was a postdoc at the time and I thought people were completely insane to buy the stock at the IPO when this was Google. Uh, and since then the stock valuation has probably gone up by a factor of 100 or 1,000. At the time it sounded like it was very overvalued. Uh, so don't take stock advice from me. Um, it's, it's hard to make predictions in particular about the future. Free energy. Um, yes. So, oh, yes, sorry, handouts for today. Pass them. Well, I can give you one, two, three there. So why, now that we've just talked about all these things and said that drug design kind of works, why would, do, would we need to head back in the computers and start doing some of these things in computers instead? Well, the reason is that drug design works, but it's, it's exactly the things we mentioned. It's slow, it's inefficient, and it's expensive. And there are also some things that are difficult to do simply if, again, our, the small lab that you were working in, you might not have the equipment to do all these tests. You also, just organization-wise, it's very difficult to have these large teams go doing drug design. And the advantage of computers, for all their other faults, and they do have numerous ones, computers get roughly twice as fast every 18 months. And there is no other experimental technique that can compete with that. Possibly sequencing, but that's it. So, as limited as computers have been traditionally, things grow exponentially. And if you could now take many of these, all these tests, all the complicated things that we had to outsource, and if you could run them overnight in a computer instead, that's very attractive. So that, then I'm not just saying this theoretically, so that um, the company, for instance, the Shaw Research that I mentioned, David Shaw, they also own a very high stake in another company called Schrödinger. And Schrodinger is a company that develops these computational chemistry tools. Uh, and there are a number of famous investors, including both um, Bill Gates and uh, Paul Allen, 
that have invested a few tens of millions of dollars in each of these technologies. So that these companies are breaking even, they're even making profit, but they're not yet making gigantic profits. But I think this is gradually where we're heading. So the idea is to, rather than going top down, that in a few cases at least, can we go bottom up and use simulations, models and everything to derive information about free energies. And an obvious way would be binding free energies if we could predict how well these drugs that we talked about this morning, how well they're going to bind. But there are a bunch of other things that maybe we would like to get the free energies of those transition states, right? To explain how fast or slow things happen. Um, maybe we want to calculate how soluble different molecules are in water. This is something that's pretty interesting to the pharmaceutical companies. If I could do this in one minute, if you can take those one million molecules in the database, rather than testing them, I could calculate the solubility. And then we don't need to spend a day per molecule testing how soluble it is. Then we know what molecules are soluble enough so that we, you know, we only need to test those. The binding, I already mentioned, um, there might be some sort of reaction coordinate that is what happens as a molecule is moving or as I'm pulling in a molecule or something. I will show that with a few slides later on. That's going to be easier. I will tell a little about something called free energy cycles, which is related to mutations. And uh, then towards the end, we're going to speak a little bit about calculations in simulations and our research. So you already know the background to the free energy, that the free energy determines the relative likelihood of states. And this states could be the fraction of bound versus the fraction of unbound. I already mentioned when we talk about membrane proteins that you will frequently invert this, that we can talk, we could measure the fraction of a membrane protein that was inserted versus not inserted. And if I do that, I can extract the delta G between them just by taking RT, LN, the difference, uh, the quotient of the probability. And that's why you see this RT, LN case everywhere. The case, the equilibrium constant, is literally going to describe the relative probabilities of being on the left versus the right-hand side. And we also know by now that all chemical reactions will follow the path that will go down free energy-wise. So that if we can calculate free energies, you can calculate what happens. We might not be able to say exactly how fast it happens. That will also require us to calculate the barriers. But if we, the point is, if we know free energies, we know everything about a system. And that's why it's somewhat like a holy grail. And you know this, that we've looked at this as statistical mechanics. You looked at this as statistical, uh, sorry, in MD simulations. Uh, and if you haven't done it yet in the lab, I never remember the order of the labs and how they're synchronized. But you're going to be looking at this a little bit, both with docking and simulations in the last few labs here. The problem, though, is that while it's easy to get the enthalpy here, that's something I can calculate from one snapshot. To get the free energy, I also need the entropy. And the only way you can get the entropy is to run a small simulation and let the system sample this so that I effectively get the probabilities, the probability of being in a particular state. And here, too, as I said, this P delta V term, we always ignore it because it's not important for whatever we do. And unfortunately, the delta S here is, well, there is no simple way to directly get the delta S from a simulation. On the other hand, if you think about it the opposite way, if I, if I run a very long simulation and I calculate what fraction of the molecules are in the water versus what fraction of the molecules are in oil, I effectively get the probabilities, right? So I can certainly get this the back way from the probabilities. So if you bear with me a little while here, um, I'll come back to that in a second and say how you get. So a simple way is that you can take the solute and imagine that we have it in vacuum or air. Air is virtually the same as vacuum. And then we take this small molecule and put it in water. And then we would like to calculate how much did this change the free energy. Virtually all these parameters we had in force fields have actually been obtained the opposite way. That we know, for instance, how much, what is the free energy of solvating, say, benzene in water. That's a side chain of uh, phenylalanine. And from that, we can parameterize phenylalanine. And that we covered already the first two lectures, that this is super important for protein folding. So one of the reasons why we can simulate proteins fairly accurately 
is that we have cheated a bit and used all the experimental properties to parameterize our simulations. We don't try to get this from quantum mechanics. But you can take, if we now know the partition coefficient of that small side chain, you could also calculate how different is it to put it in water versus the membrane. We can calculate that reasonably accurately. Or if this is a side chain, we can calculate how likely is it that the side chain is facing the solvent here or that it would be on the inside of the protein. And again, here you're just really talking about probabilities. If you simulate this long enough, I can see what fraction of, if we spend it 1% of the time, it's going to be here, 99% of the time it's here. Then I can calculate how accurate it is. We even had, I even had a student, one of my first students years ago, uh, that started out to look at exactly these insertion free energies when we had, for instance, arginines at different locations in the helices to understand all these results that we got from the strange membrane insertion, and it works quite well. Um, you get curves based on this that describe if you have a glutamic acid or arginine, how much does it cost to put this in different positions in a helix. So the point is not that it's exactly accurate, but we can use it to understand what happened and in particular how much water they are pulling in the membrane and everything. But this is still on the fun to understand by a physics point of view. What we would like to get is get some sort of free energy of binding. If you have that small molecule bound to your tyrosine kinase receptor, what is the binding energy? Kilojoules per mole, or you can measure it in concentration too. And there is actually a, th there is actually a fairly easy way to do that. The free energy of binding is the amount of work that we gain, uh, basically, I can take that molecule and if I slowly pull that out, the work I need to do to remove this, well, once I am in the state where it's fully removed, this would be reversible, right? The way I got there is not important. The free energy difference between two, so the free energy is a state variable. So if I have a way to smoothly remove this molecule from the protein, and if I can measure how much work or energy I have to add when I do this, that should be the free energy of the process. This is a bit fussy because we, it might not be obvious how it is, but I would argue that one way is if I just put, put a small spring here and then I start pulling in the spring. I know exactly how much force I'm adding because I'm literally pulling in the spring myself. I let the computer pull. And force multiplied by distance is energy, right? And then I know how much energy I had to add to pull this out. There is one problem here. If I do this very fast, what's going to happen? I generate heat, right? Friction. So if I take a molecule and move it very fast through water, I'm going to be generating a lot of heat in the water. And the point is that now I'm not at exactly the same state. So this works if I pull this infinitely slow. I need to pull it, or at least, of course, I, I can't pull it infinitely slow, right? But I'm going to pull it so slow that I'm in equilibrium all the way, so that I'm not really heating up the water to any significant extent. And if I could do this very slowly, I could, you could imagine doing it the other way. Once I'm here and I gradually pull it back, if I can go smoothly between two states, I should be able to measure how much force I added. And let's see, I have an example here, yes. If I had to add a lot of force here, right? Sorry, if it's a strong binder, I had to pull with a lot of force. And the integral under that curve would then correspond to the energy, while the red curve here would be a much weak binder. This works. It's not what we normally do in simulations, but for a few cases, we absolutely need this. And if you think that this is artificial in a simulation, uh, it's not. You can do this in an experiment, too, with an atomic force microscope. And there have been some really cool examples with GPCR proteins in particular. So that an atomic force microscope is really just a tip. It is a very narrow tip. And this tip is so narrow that at the very edge of the tipper, you just have one or a handful of atoms with. And then on the back side of the tipper, you have a mirror. And then you shine a laser on this mirror. And then you're detecting if this cantilever moves, because the sample here moves up by just a few angstroms, you're going to get small, small, small deviations in the mirror here, right? And based on that, you're going to hit different parts on the photo detector. These are surprisingly cheap and simple microscopes. It's not really a microscope that you're seeing things, but we can, 
we can get this tip to just scan over the small surface. And the type of experiments that people have been doing there, you have, for instance, you can take bacteria rhodopsin and pull it out of a membrane. It's very cool to take some of these proteins that are involved, for instance, in muscles, these proteins that were elastic that we talked about. We can literally get them to attach to this tip, and then I'm measuring how much force am I applying when I'm pulling this apart. I think this is even an example. No, sorry, this is not a movie. Um, so this is one small part. They take a small molecule bound to one of these proteins, and then we attach the small spring to it, and then we gradually pull this out. And then we did this in the simulations. You have very noisy forces here. And then they tried to pull with different rates and everything, and then they argued so that when it's very high rate here, the force ends up being very high because you're generating lots of friction. And then they're arguing at some point this starts going down, and then they're extrapolating here that if we could pull infinitely slow, we would be, have a force somewhere down here. So it kind of works. And it's fun because we can actually gain information about, for instance, how much energy would it really require to pull something out of a membrane. Or if you have this chain, the nascent chain in a uh, ribosome, the ribosome is kind of pulling on this chain, right? Because it's, the chain is being pulled through the ribosome. How hard is it pulling on the chain? And we can measure that both in the lab and in simulations and get roughly similar results. Is it Depends on what you mean by accurate. Uh, we're not interested in getting the force here with three decimals, right? If it's a large system and you're talking about understanding, you want to know, are we talking about piconewtons or nanonewtons or newtons? And it's going to be closer to piconewtons. The other thing that you see up here, is this accurate? No, it's very noisy, right? But the free energy doesn't depend on the force there. The free energy here is going to be the integral of this. And you might be aware of that. But anytime you integrate functions, the integration has an averaging effect. So when you, if you look at these, there are three curves here, right? So the solid, the dashed, and the dotted. And they all fluctuate around the same values. I would bet that the integral of those three curves, while the curves vary, the integral of the three are likely within 1% of each other. So that by the time you integrate them, the differences are going to be smaller than you think. But that sounds bad. There are errors of 1% or something. Um, how will that compare to an experiment? So that experiments are not as good as you think. What, what do you think the error is in an experiment? It can easily be 10%. If you're measuring one binding, I'm going to come back to binding energies in a second. If you're measuring binding energies of one million molecules, how many times do you think you do each experiment? Well, unless you do it multiple times, you're not even going to have standard errors, right? Let's be generous. Let's say that you made it three times. And then you might get the binding to be five kilocalories per mole plus minus three kilocalories per mole. <laughs> you can have lousy experimental results. So in many cases, the experimental error is larger than the computational error. So these, this is important if there are large changes in a molecule, or there might be a large receptor, then I really want to happen. What happens when this entire receptor opens? And then I would need to take the entire protein and force the protein to undergo this transition. My ion channels is yet another example. I know that the ion channels will have to open up. And can I force the ion channel to open up to understand the free energy difference? So maybe I have an closed state here, and then a barrier, and then an open state. And this would correspond to the radius of my channel. And I can do something like that by forcing, pushing the channel open and measuring how much force I need to do. And then, okay, so there's one stable state here, there is a transition state, and there's another stable state here. And when it comes to my ion channels, what I'm interested in is, what is this delta G1? And same thing, what is that delta G2? And what I care about here is not whether it's 5.39 or 5.38. What I care about is this 2 or 20. Because that's going to influence how quickly the reaction happens, right? So frequently, we sometimes talk about qualitative results. But qualitative results are usually more than fine even for designing a drug. So the concept here is universal. To get the free energy between the two states, they are state variables, so the free energy can only depend on the state. And to measure that, or to calculate it, I need to measure 
how much energy do I need to add or remove when I force the system to move between these two states. And what I hinted, but that this will only work if I stay in equilibrium all the time I do this. Because otherwise I keep adding heat, friction or something. So I need to do, in general I need to do this very slow. This is actually a universal result. So anything I have, for instance these small molecules, I talked about this FKBP protein yesterday. If I want to calculate how much energy do we gain by binding that particular molecule here, there are two states I have here. I have, on the one state I have the protein without anything bound and the small ligand in water. And in the other state I have the protein with the ligand bound. This particular ligand is called FK501. And it's a pretty boring name for a protein because the protein is named after the ligand. So this is FK binding protein. So the only thing we need to do to be able to calculate this, we need to find a way to go between these two states. If I can calculate how much energy I need to add or work I need to do to move between that state and that state or between that state and that state, I can calculate the free energy. And the point here is that the path does not matter. If the path mattered, they would not be state variables. And here is where we can be smart. There's something that says on the very last line here. Simulations do not have to obey the laws of physics. That sounds horrible. And it's not quite strictly true. I, or somehow I need to obey the gen the simulations need to be specified that from the laws of physics, but they don't, I don't necessarily need to restrict simulations of things that can happen. Let's, let's see if I can come up with an analogy here. Well, again, let's use the example of uh, me. We want to measure how expensive it is for me to go up one stair. And the obvious way is to calculate my weight, uh, which I have no idea what it is, probably 100 kilos now and raise that energy by, let's see, five meters or something. So I need to walk out and I need to go 100 meters in that direction, take the stairs and go back here. And then we would be 100 kilos, five meters taller up. That would be a way of measuring that free energy. Or I could transport, well, calculate the quantum chemical process if I tunnel through the roof here. <laughs> what result will you get? The same one, right? So while it's obvious, uh, and in this particular case, let's assume that it was easier for us to calculate the tunneling, it's not going to be. The point is I am allowed, if I only want to know the difference, I don't need to take the same path that nature would take. If for some reason, for nature it's of course easier to take the stair path, right? But what if it was easier in the computer to calculate the tunneling? So what I did before, when I'm gradually pulling a molecule out, I'm doing exactly the thing that nature would do. I would unbind the entire molecule. But what if you have two gigantic proteins? So here's protein one with 1,500 residues. And then you have another gigantic protein with 1,500 residues here. And here we have that small mutant that you had. Trying to pull these entire proteins apart, it would lead to gigantic free energy differences, right? But the only thing that we were interested in, did that mutation help or hurt the binding? But let's assume that you could calculate this. Let's assume we can't pull them apart. It's going to be slow in a computer, but I can do it. And the result is 1,593 kilojoules per mole. for the wild type, the binding energy, sorry, the minus is binding. That doesn't tell you anything. So the only thing that helps is if we can do this both for the wild type and the mutant, right? Let's do it for the mutant too. Uh, it's minus 1,596 kilojoule per mole. Wild type. Uh, I need 394 B. This was the the dosage you proposed, right? Yes. So what would you say based on this? 
the mutant, well, sorry, it's negative here, so it's going down is good. So this appears to be the mutant being, the mutant would enhance the binding, because negative binding, binding energies are negative when they are good. Oh, sure. When I, yes, you're right. And when I, when I pull them apart, that's why I added the minus. I, when I pull them apart, I would need to pay 5093 in one case, right? But when I report that, I report it as the binding energy so that I need to change the sign there. Well, it might appear that way, but here's the problem. You don't get 5093. Do you really think you have four digits of accuracy in this result? So if this gigantic things, when you're pulling them apart, the real way of the reporting the first result would be 5093 say plus minus, say, 10 kilojoules per mole. And the other one would be 1596, say, plus minus 9 kilojoules per mole. So the real result we have here, I'm not going to do the, I'll come back to the way we combine this. But the, the difference here then is roughly 3 plus minus, let's say, the ballpark of 10 kilojoules per mole. So you don't even know what the sign is. The problem is that you're taking, you're, this is a very small difference between two gigantic numbers, right? And while compared to 1593, this is a great standard deviation. It's only one part in one part in 100 that's wrong. But because the difference is so small, now the error is the ballpark of three times larger. This would actually be probably be 13 or so, because you can add them with the square root. So this doesn't work at all. And this is frequently what you end up in when you try to come. You can never, you, comparing large numbers doesn't work. So what we need to do, we would like to find a way that if you have a large molecule bound, if I have two molecules that are quite similar, what is the difference between these two molecules? I would tell you, what is the difference of that alanine 394V mutant? You would like to test only that without completely pulling them apart. Before we do that, let's look at one molecule. Um, it makes it slightly easier. So normally, one state you had is that you had the protein and the molecule, and they are not interacting. And on the one hand, we have the protein and the molecule, and they are interacting. But to go between those two states, I would need to pull the molecule to or from the protein. And if this is a large molecule, that's where things go wrong. So let's draw a couple of states up here. Up here, we have the protein and the ligand bound. And that's one of the states that I want to be in. Let's just for a second assume that I take this ligand and I gradually turn it into a ghost. I gradually disappear all the atoms. I, first, it's 99%. And then I gradually turn down all the atoms to zero. I just turn off all the atom interactions. You can't do that. Well, I can in a computer. And of course, when I'm here, the ligand is present to 50%. That's a completely unrealistic and unphysical state. But I am allowed to do it in a computer. And when I'm down here, I have the protein. And then I have a molecule that doesn't really exist. It's just a dummy that's not interacting with anything. Sorry? It's basically, these are, remember, these are just coordinates in a computer. But when I've turned off those coordinates completely, they, they don't exist. They are just points in space without any interaction. So then I just have the protein here. This would then be the case when I just have the ligand in water. So think of the having, taking the ligand and pulling that away from the protein. You can certainly simulate the ligand in water in a simulation, right? But I, if I have that ligand in water, I could gradually turn off the ligand in water too. Just gradually remove all those interactions. That is also a well-defined state. So then I just have water with nothing in it. So each of these corners is well-defined. This means that I just have, here I have the protein and the ligand in water. Here I just have the ligand in water. Here I just have water. And here I just have the protein. And what I really want to, what I really want to find out is that how much does it cost when I move the ligand to the protein? But that's hard, because then I would need to pull it away. But let's say that if you accept it for a second, that in theory I could go between all these states in a computer. If I start out here, and then I go there, and then I go there, and then I go there, and then I go there. And 
what is the free energy difference? Zero, because I'm back where I started. And free energy is a state variable. So the smart thing here is that the difference between these two states must be the same as the difference between those two states. The sum of the entire circle here must be zero. And again, this dummy, I'm not really changing anything here because the protein would, here in the water, sorry, I didn't draw that. So here I would have the protein in the water too. I'm not changing the protein on that side. So that here I just have the protein in the dummy and there I just have the dummy in the water. I haven't changed anything there. So that with a bit of argument, you can argue that that's going to be zero. So while this is what I would like to calculate, this is hard to calculate in a computer. But these two paths are kind of simple to calculate in a computer. They're not physical, they're horrible things. I'm gradually turning things off, but I can do that in a computer. I can't stop halfway, because when I'm halfway in, I'm in a completely unphysical state. But when I've gotten to the other side, that is a well-defined state. And so this corresponds to calculating me tunneling through the roof here. I can't stop halfway, but once I am at the other state, and if I can't calculate this efficiently, the result will be valid. And now I'm not calculating the entire protein. I'll, I'll show you one more slide before we take a break because I realize this sounds a bit confusing now, right? We normally don't do this for one ligand. Um, but if we could, this would create the absolute difference in free energy of binding. But the problem, if you think about large molecules here, that would still be 1,500. It's still a very large number. And then I could calculate for one more ligand, and then we get another very large number. And we're not so interested in this 1593. I'm interested in what is the difference from my small, either a difference in an amino acid, or if you have an entire series of different drugs, what is the difference? So we're virtually always interested in difference in free energies, not the absolute free energies. But actually, this binding energy, that per se was a difference in free energy, right? So what you typically want, if I want to see, I want to see differences of differences. I will repeat this after the break too, but I will at least introduce the concept to you now. This is not as complicated as it, as it looks. My two molecules, the cost of pulling them apart was a difference in free energy, right? That's a delta G. But what the real question is, the, the question we wanted to ask, if you swap that alanine for a valine, how did that change the binding energy? And that's a difference of a difference. So the delta delta G corresponds when I make this mutation, do I improve or deteriorate the binding? And the smart thing here I can do is that I don't really need to pull the entire molecules apart. So if here's a protein and then another receptor protein, let's just gradually change the alanine to the valine here. And then I take it when they are, so first I do this in one case when they are bound. I gradually change an alanine to a valine when they are bound. That's a tiny difference. It's just like 10 atoms I'm changing out of an interface where we had 500 residues. The computer is going to be really good at doing that. And then I remove this I protein and I do exactly the same calculation, but just with the, say, the left hand protein. I gradually change my alanine to a valine. It's also a very small difference I'm calculating there. So let's say one of them might be, say, 3 plus minus. Let's say that the error here was, again, 1 in 100. So it's 3 plus minus 0.03 kilojoules per mole. And in the other case, I say that it's going to be 6 plus minus 0 0.006 kilojoules per mole. But here too, you have one state when both of them are in wild type bound. I have one state where I have the mutant in the bound complex. I can think of removing that and removing that. Here too, this is a cycle. If I take the entire cycle, the difference must be zero. And here's the beauty. What I was interested in, how much does it cost to bind the wild type compared to how much does it cost to bind the mutant? Here's the bind, that process is binding the mutant, that process is binding the wild type, right? Both of them were plus minus 1500. The difference here 
will correspond to the difference here. But those two processes are trivial to calculate. So let's do the math here again. The difference between these would be, say, roughly 3 plus minus, this would be maybe something plus minus 0 0.008. Do you see what I get? The error here is like 100 times smaller. So now I can definitely say that one of them was better. The error here is just 0.1 kilojoules per mole. I realize this is a bit confusing. Think about this during the break. Take 30 minutes, and then I will go through it once more in detail. Yes, question? Uh, 3 plus 0 0.03 is delta G1, right? And delta, uh, the 6 plus 0 0.06 is delta G2. Exactly. So you need to be a little, so I, I was a little bit sloppy here. You need to be careful with the signs here by, because the free energy in one direction here is going to be minus the free energy in the other direction. So I didn't bother about the sign. We can do that after the break if you want to. But the point is yes. So the three here is one of them and the six here is one of them. These two would be the 1300 and 1300 plus three. So the difference between them is the same, but both of these are going to be gigantic free energies that are difficult to calculate both of these are going to be small free energies that are easy to calculate. And now, of course, these are fake transitions. They could not happen in nature. I can't swap an alanine to a valine inside a protein or inside a complex. But here's the point. I am allowed to cheat in the simulations. I can't stop halfway. But if the end state I get to is physically well-defined, I am allowed to calculate it that way. I will repeat that in detail after the break because this is an important concept. It's 10.33, so let's meet here at just after 11. I'll get started again and have a second shot at these free energy cycles. So I think the easiest way might be to take you through an example. It's a bit artificial because I'm going to need to invent numbers. But I'll just remind you that there were two reasons we did this. Uh, one of them was that, in general, if you have very large molecules, pulling them apart will be computationally difficult. It's going to be expensive. Uh, and because you're also doing a large change, we eventually, at some point, we want to see the difference between the changes, right? And this is not specific to simulation, but any time you end up taking a difference between two large numbers that have roughly the same magnitude, it's going to be impossible because that's... While the, di even the difference might be a factor 100 smaller than the numbers, but the standard deviation doesn't shrink. So you're going to end up with the standard deviation that's roughly the same magnitude as your difference in that case. And just before the break, I argued that this might be easier to understand if you had these two large molecules. But it's actually going to work equally well if you have one molecule here, the receptor E, and then you have a small ligand, say your drug. And this is one type of drug. I prime, you can think of, if this is I, let's say that I is a benzene molecule. And I prime is a, let's say toluene or something. So you have one small group added to the molecule. So of course, I and I prime are different molecules, right? That's, there is no experiment that would turn I into I prime directly. But in a computer, I could take this molecule and gradually disappear this one, gradually get that atom to disappear and replace it with the hydrogen instead. So if you think in the first time, in the first case, it's a carbon with three oxygens, uh, sorry, three hydrogens. And if I gradually turn the charge of those hydrogens to zero, and the charge of the hydrogen, I gradually change that to the charge of a hydrogen, and I gradually change their masses. I'm not saying exactly how we're going to do it, but it's possible to do in a simulation. And the end state, the starting state is well-defined, and the end state is well-defined. And what I'm really interested in is that how much does it cost to bind benzene versus how much does it cost to bind toluene? So let's try to make that difference. Uh, the one thing that's important here is to keep track of the signs of the arrows. So let's, we can use the right example just for fun. And let's assume that the delta G's here correspond to the arrow that it's closest to. If this delta G is 5, what is the delta G going to be if you follow the arrow in the other direction? Minus 5. So that it's, it's important 
it's not that delta G1 plus delta G2 plus delta G3 plus delta G4 necessarily sums to zero. That depends on the direction of the arrows. So, but let's make an example here. If you first take toluene, uh, sorry, benzene here, and then when it's bound in the receptor and turn it to toluene, that's delta G3. And I will just, for argument's sake, say that that is 3 plus minus 0 0.1 kilojoule per mole. So that would be delta G3. And again, the sign matters here, so it's in that direction. And then I do the same thing for the toluene here. Sorry, benzene turning it to toluene, but without when it's not bound. So that would be delta G4, right? It's exactly the same simulation I'm doing, but now I'm doing it when it's not bound to the protein. So then we said delta G4, and let's say that that is 3.5 plus minus 0 0.1 kilojoule per mole. So these are the raw results I get from the computers. But this is not the difference in binding energy. These are completely artificial numbers when I do this alchemical operation of turning one molecule to another molecule. To actually calculate what the binding energy is, we're going to need to sum up the entire free energy cycle. And I would always recommend you, when you do this, do the sum. Don't assume that the arrows are placed the same way they were last time. So in this case, if we start here and we go down, well, then I'm following the arrow in the delta G1 sign. So then I'm saying at delta G1. And then I am in this state. And then I continue in that direction. That is delta G4. And it's in the direction that I'm following the arrow. So it's plus delta G4. And now I am in I prime, and then now I go up there. But then I'm going against this arrow, right? So it's minus delta G2, minus delta G2. And then I'm on the top right corner, going to the top left corner, and then it's against that arrow again. So it's also minus delta G3. That has to be 0, because now I'm back when I started. And then I. Then I get the equation where it says at the bottom here. So if I move over the two negative, let's see, maybe, delta G1, and I keep delta G2 on the left-hand side. And then I move delta G3, that's going to change side sign, delta G3, and delta G4, that I change the sign there too. But the point of delta G3 and delta G4 is what I had up here, right? The difference between those two is delta G3 minus delta G4. So that would be equals to minus 0 0.5 plus minus roughly it's going to be 0.15 kilojoules per mole. So the difference between delta G1, which was... In this case, it's actually unbinding benzene versus unbinding toluene. That would be that difference. And I never, ever did any simulation when I removed anything. I only made the small changes turning one molecule to the other. And this will work equally well if you have two gigantic receptors. So this is a trick, but I'm allowed to cheat um, because I'm doing things that are easy to do in the computer that would be impossible to do in nature. But at the end, I end up with the difference between the two binding things that would be what I could measure in the lab. It's not impossible to measure delta G1 and delta G2, but these would likely correspond to taking a, taking a simulation and pulling the entire molecule out. And then I might instead get 1500 and 1499. And the difference between 1500 and 1499 is plus 1. But then also, because the numbers are a factor 100 larger, the errors will also be a factor 100 larger. So then the remaining error would be much larger than my difference. That is a general result in science. Never, ever, you must avoid any experiment where you end up taking differences between two large numbers, because you're going to ruin your accuracy. Yes? It's sampling, basically, because you can't sample. If you could sample the phase space, the partition function completely, right? <coughs> then it would be perfect. But any finite simulation, you're not going to sample phase space completely. 
Then there are potential other errors. There could be errors in your parameters. We will come back to that yesterday. Uh, sorry, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Me. We'll come back to that tomorrow. Uh, when I, and I, I know that from, it was actually last year, right, where you don't have that much statistics training. So tomorrow I'm going to have like 10 slides when we talk about statistics in general for life science on a very basic level. Um, you know, I'll skip the talking about distributions. Um, the point is that if you're calculating a free energy between two states that are very similar, it's a molecule with or without a proton. That's not going to change anything else in the system. And then you could almost, then you can, if, they, if the molecules are exactly identical, they're going to behave in the same way. Their freedom is the same. And then the entropy is the same. If the entropy is the same, it's really only the enthalpy or the potential difference that matters. And then you can calculate that right away. But it's not going to work that way in practice. For any realistic molecule, they're going to bind in different ways. And then we'll also change the entropy. Uh, you will see a little bit about this in some lab. But for now, you can forget about the things that says Gromax here. I stole this slides from another presentation I've been giving. In general, we're going to be calculating free energies between different states. And then, well, one way to do it could be to simulate the entire system and just calculate the populations or the probabilities. Because if you know P1 and P2 right, then you can deduce what the delta G between them has to be. The only problem here is that in many cases, you have a very large barrier or something. So this is going to be exceptionally inefficient. The other thing is could be that there might be the free energy difference might be so big that you're going to have 9,999 molecules out of 10,000 in the bound state and nothing in the bound bound state. And you need statistics in both states to be able to calculate relative probability. So that doesn't work well either. But what we can do is that in physics, remember that I said if the, left, if the starting state is well defined and the end state is well defined, all I need to do is if I can gradually slowly move from one state to another, if I can calculate how much energy I'm adding or removing when I do that, then I will know what the free energy between them is. And this concept Hamiltonian in physics is really the, the description of all the interactions in the system. And normally I would say, so what are all the interaction systems in some sort of state A, say when I have, when this is a benzene? And then I can also define, so what are all the interactions in the system where this is a state B, say when it's a toluene? And then just gradually move between them. And one easy way is that all the atoms that don't exist in one state, let's say, let's put the charge and interactions and everything to zero. And then I'm gradually growing or removing the atoms. Completely unrealistic, but it's something I, it's well described. The equations are well described in the computer. And then I can actually calculate the difference in pre energy by summing up all the small differences in the energy here while I'm doing it. And this is something you're going to need to believe me. I don't have time to prove this. Is this uh, the zero? No. Um, okay. Uh, remember that I said two slides ago that if two states are very similar, that so that the entropy is that the, the the states they occupy are going to be the same. In that case, you don't have to care about the entropy. And what this works on, do you see the integral there? Is that at any small point in time, we can calculate right here what is the difference if I move a tiny amount to the left and right. And what you can then actually prove is that if you simulate this and calculate this over all possible states in the system, so that the average of the change in enthalpy averaged over all possible conformations will correspond to the average of free energy. And it's by averaging in all states, that's how you get the entropy part. I'm sorry, that was the part that I tried to, it, it's a fairly deep mathematical result. For now, don't worry about it. It's something that the program can tell you. But we're gradually, we're getting the, if you have a protein and I, it's right now, it's 50% toluene and 50% benzene, I can calculate exactly at this point, what is the difference in free energy. So the way we do this, and again, this is not a course in statistical physics. I don't expect you to know all the details, but we find some way to describe that. Let's introduce a parameter, say lambda. So when lambda is zero here, well, the second term is zero, so that disappears, and the system would be entirely in the first states. So this is where all the interactions correspond to benzene. 
And then when lambda is 1, then this term would disappear and all the interactions would correspond to toluene. And if I'm gradually changing lambda between 0 and 1, I'm slowly moving along this arrow. And no matter if lambda is 0 0.47, all the interactions here are well-defined, all the interactions here are well-defined, so I, the computer can't calculate this. It's a lot of equations and you need to evaluate the entire force field, but the computer can do it. It's not, it's not difficult, it's just that it's a lot of bookkeeping. Well, there are some problems though, that if my atom starts to have a zero Lena jones parameter, but it has plus charge, there are cases where atoms can overlap and everything. There are some tricks to get around that that I don't think I'll have time to cover in detail. And what you do in practice is that if you have something like this solvent, you have this parameter so that the parameter can be between zero and one. And typically you tend to pick say 10 values. Zero, say 10%, 20%, all the way up to 100%. And then you run 10 small simulations and each simulation only sample what if I had a little bit more of this molecule or a little bit less of this molecule and then when I sum up all the changes of all of these I would actually get what it would be the total effect of completely growing my molecule in the water yes okay good uh, there are some tricks that you might have to do that uh, you don't want these horrible peaks where if two atoms overlap, and if, if I've turned an atom into a ghost, they could in theory overlap, and then I would have an infinite energy. But we can cheat there too. So while I'm in the middle of this process, I say that, oh, I allowed the atoms to overlap. The energy is not infinite, even if you overlap. As long as in the starting and end states, I move back to something that's physical and realistic. If you didn't follow that, don't worry for now. Uh, but my point is this, that this is what you get to. Um, so if this is, this is an alcohol that I'm solvating in water. And then the lambda parameter here goes from zero to one. And in this case is more, it's probably 20 simulations. And in each of these points, I then calculate roughly how much is the free energy changing here as a function of lambda. So if I had, in this particular case, if I had a little bit more of the molecule, it would not like it because the change here is positive. While here it's negative. So you end up with a bit of variation and the variation here comes from as I'm turning charges on or off or if I'm turning the Lena Jones parameters on or off or if I'm turning the bonds on or off. So it's not, you can't really understand exactly what happens in these curves. But the point is that then I just take the integral under these curves and the integral under this curve will correspond to the total difference in free end. And as noisy as these curves look, the integration operation is averaging. So you actually end up with fairly good values of delta G. Computers today, for small molecules, computers are at least as good as experiments at calculating the solvation free energies of small molecules. And this is something that is used on massive scale in the pharmaceutical industry. You get solvation of a new molecule in 10 minutes, rather than, exp it's not so much that it's difficult to measure in the lab, but the part that's expensive is of course you need to produce the molecule to measure it in the lab. Yes? What's the Uh, so this had to do, there are slightly different ways. This has to do with trying to avoid those peaks. Uh, the red curve has to do with if we do it in vacuum and the blue, ha the blue and black has to do whether we do it in water. So these are actually just slightly different ways of calculating it and they might look like they're completely different, right? But the point is that the integral of them is going to be roughly the same. So they take slightly different paths in this non-physical space between the two states but the final value when you integrate them is going to be roughly the same. So here the blue curve is lower, but there it's higher. So the total area under them is going to be roughly the same. If you thought that was difficult, there are easier ways to think about free energy. Uh, potentials of mean force is something that we hear quite a lot. And I already showed you one of those. And the potential of mean force is exactly what it is. In general, the force is the derivative of the potential, right? So if you think about potential energy or something, the difference in energy between two states, the derivative of that as I'm changing it is the force I need to apply to it. But if, when I took that molecule and pulled them, if I measure the force, and if I slowly measure the force if I'm pulling something, if I'm measuring the force, I can effectively get that potential back. <laughs> 
And what I said before the break is that, yes, if I measure the potential all the way when I'm pulling something out, I can calculate how much it costs to pull it out. But it's not just a matter of pulling it out. I actually get this as a function of, say, the position. If I take a small molecule in water and then I gradually pull it into a membrane, I will actually get the entire shape of the molecule, that how expensive it is to have it water, how good is it to have it in the head groups, how bad is it going to be to have it in the center of the membrane. So I can get this as a function of the position. Or if I have a large protein, the ion channel I showed you, as the ion channel is opening or closing, right? I can actually trace the potential free energy, not just in the open and closed states, but I will see what is the transition state. How much does it cost if I'm, as I'm forcing the molecule or something to follow a particular path? What is the energy at each specific point? So that the force is incredibly noisy, but the average of the force in a simulation, if I'm under equilibrium, if I take the integral of that, that's going to be the free energy with respect to the coordinates that I'm changing. Let's show you an example of this instead. Um, if I take two molecules, one molecule here and one molecule there, if I define some distance between them, I can say what is the energy as a function of this distance, and then I run this in a simulation, and then I change this distance. I force them to either be further apart or closer together. And the way I do that is literally by attaching a small spring with them. And I can get the spring to either pull them together or push them apart. Then I will see what is the energy as a function of distance between these two molecules. So at each distance, there are going to be a ton of different relative orientations and everything. So that I will need to sample. I can't just calculate it once. And the really important part here has to do with the membrane. I can take a molecule and gradually pull this into a membrane. Now, if I just calculate it for one frame here, one snapshot, there are going to be noise. The atoms here, so at each point here, I need to simulate a few tens, tens of thousands of steps or something so that I average all the properties of the molecules and effectively get the free energy instead of just the energy. But if I do that, I will literally get a curve that describes how much energy do I gain or lose at each z coordinate here through the membrane. Yes? So gamma can, gamma can either be um, the appearance or disappearance of a certain atom or group? Do you mean lambda or? Yeah. yeah. Lambda, lambda is just a, what you call a parameter, right? So that we, we use this parameter to describe as if I'm going from one state or not. So here, in this case, we typically don't use lambda. But you can say that lambda is 0 here and 1 here. So it's just a way to describe a, a, a relative change. So it's a dimensionless parameter, so just so that we can translate this to the computer. But in this particular case, it's just a matter of measuring how much force do I need to apply to this atom to keep it at this position. And here, if this is water soluble, the force will likely be roughly zero, right? The molecule will likely move up, up and down a bit so that it's going to fluctuate a bit, but in general it will be zero. But let's say that this was a hydrophilic molecule. And if I now move it into the membrane and I put it here, there's going to be a gigantic force that the molecule would like to move out of the membrane. So I have to apply a lot of force inwards to keep it in the membrane. But this too is going to be noisy. It's going to fluctuate up or down. But in general, I'm going to need to apply a force downwards to keep it here. And if you integrate this force, you're going to get a free energy. Let's see here. This I said hydrophilic, right? So it's going to be like to be out in water, and then it's going to hate to be in the membrane, and then it's going to like to be out in water, roughly. And can you imagine doing something like that in a lab, calculating how expensive it is to keep a specific helix, say, in the head group region? I can't even imagine an experiment that can do that. So that the neat thing here is that we can use computer simulations to understand processes, even understanding transition states. What if this is a horribly, if this is a very hydrophilic molecule, somewhere in here at the very peak of the membrane, right? It might even look something like that. That is by far the worst possible case you can have this water-loving molecule. But that's kind of like a transition state. Could you imagine that that's important? Well, understanding whether arginine would like to be in the middle of a membrane. We don't need a computer simulation to tell us that's not very likely. But we have transport through membranes. So how frequently is, how easy is it for a water molecule to go through a membrane? If you think a lipid, how frequent is it for a lipid to flip from one side of the membrane to another side of the membrane? 
We know that it happens in nature, but it's a very slow process. The speed by which this happens is going to depend on the transition states, right? And what had we just said about transition states the last few days? We can't observe them. The computer can observe them. So in the computer, I can force the molecule to be at the transition state and measure how expensive is it. If I force you to be at the transition state, I know you don't want to be there. But if I force you to be there anyway, I can measure the barrier of the transition state in a computer, which is completely impossible in the lab. So sometimes there are, they, there are two reasons for EN. Yes, in some cases, we, in some cases that we want to do it on massive scale, and then it should be cheap and fast, hopefully accurate too, but primarily cheap and fast because it's so expensive to produce the molecules. While in other cases, it's more that you would like to understand a process that it's completely impossible to study in the lab. And in this particular case, we might just be interested in one curve. I don't really care if this takes one month to calculate because I can't do it in the lab anyway. The other thing that's important with free energy is that they are strictly reversible. If I take a molecule and disappear it, turn it into a ghost, or if I'm starting from a ghost and gradually growing the molecule in that place, they have to be the opposite sign. If they were not the opposite sign, I would violate energy conservation and everything. The same process in different directions, only the sign can differ. So anytime you calculate free energies, whether it's in a computer simulation or in an experiment, check. There's this famous quote in politics, right? Trust but verify. Do your positive and negative controls. You know that it should be the opposite. So let's say that I calculate the free energy of binding. And I get two results. First, I calculate the free energy of binding, and that is minus 3 plus minus 1 kilojoule per mole. And then I calculate the energy of unbinding, and that is plus 9 plus minus 2 kilojoules per mole. What happened? We don't know, right? But there is something wrong here, because that's not possible. Maybe we made an error in the calculations. It's sadly, it's maybe we completely underestimated these errors for whatever reason, but there is something here that's wrong. They should be the opposite sign. If they are on the other end, if you see that that's plus 3 plus minus 2, then it's fine. And again, don't, this is not specific to simulations. If you can measure the same process two ways, do it. Because that's your safety check that you didn't make a mistake the first time you did it. And that leads to the other things that we're going to talk more about tomorrow. Um, estimating errors. You freak, do you think it's important to be accurate in science? No. Then we wouldn't use bioinformatics. And it's not me dissing bioinformatics. If you think about bioinformatics, bioinformatics is full of errors, right? Every single sequence alignment you've seen isn't correct. So why does bioinformatics work? Well, that depends. Uh, it's dangerous because better than nothing sounds good. Um, so would you be willing to take a drug that was developed with my better than nothing technique? So if I, I have this new drug, um, and let's say it's against headaches, and it's better than nothing. Only one out of four patients die. Would you like to take it? Okay. Uh, one in four billion patients die. So the point is, it's not that you need to be accurate, but we need to know how good or bad we are so you can make an informed decision. And in some cases, that maybe 1 in 10 is good enough. Uh, if it's just a side effect that you get a bit tired from the drug. Dying, I would probably prefer 1 in 4 billion. So that you need to know how good or bad you are. The point is, yes, of course, all other things equal. It's always better to be more accurate and precise than not being it. But you don't have that choice. 
So the point with bioinformatics, you have the p-values. We know what is the likelihood of this model being wrong. And then you can decide if it's 50-50, you likely shouldn't submit it to science. But we're not saying that the model can't be wrong. It's just saying it's, in this particular case, it's not very likely to be wrong. And then what, what error you accept, that will depend on the scenario. So I'm going to talk about that tomorrow and uh, what errors are in particular. Um, estimating errors is super difficult. And there are a bunch of very advanced techniques to do this. So if you have an entire series of values, the obvious one is to just calculate the standard deviations and turn that into a standard error. And if you didn't follow a word of that, I will cover that in detail. But there are ways, so based on the fluctuations in the data, I can estimate not just the standard deviation, because the standard deviation just measures how much my data is fluctuating. There are ways from this to derive roughly how good is my prediction. And I will cover that in detail tomorrow. But there is a problem here. Um, let's assume that I'm drawing a curve for you. You've all heard of standard deviations, right? Hmm? So let's say I'm, I'm plotting a function here. What is the, if I now give you an estimate of the average, is this, sorry, this is some sort of value y here. Do you think this is a reasonable estimate of the average? Somewhere there, right? Unfortunately, this was the temperature in Sweden, and I only measured it from January 5 to January 10. So we just predicted that the average temperature in Sweden is minus 10 degrees. So the problem is that the temperature January 6th is somewhat correlated with the temperature January 5, right? And as you simulate this over an entire year or something, eventually the temperature will start to pick up. The point is that we don't have 500 independent samples. Each sample is highly correlated with the previous sample. And this is something that you, 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 we usually sweep that under the rug in the beginning courses in statistics. There are ways to treat this too. There are a ton of advanced statistical methods that you can use, and this, of course, you have to know for uh, the exam. Um, no. The point is, A, there are programs to do this for you. Gromax, our program, is one of them. But in general, what do you do when you have a problem like this? First, you start to look it up properly. Don't assume that you know statistics. Ask a statistician if it's very important. Remember those things uh, that I told you earlier on? No, we're going to have that tomorrow. Ah, p-value hacking. There are some really fun. There are a number of very embarrassing papers, including from groups from Stockholm, that they have published amazing results, and it's just because they didn't understand proper undergraduate statistics. But undergraduate statistics is easy if your undergraduate was in statistics. So how many of you have an undergraduate in mathematical statistics? So this is, you need to know that you don't understand this. Even I don't understand this properly. I, I have a bit more experience than you. But there is a point here where you need to ask a statistician. Statistics is dangerous and difficult. It's difficult, but it's also the big danger here is that you think your results are better than they really are. And it usually has to do with these correlations that I showed you. Don't assume that you can just apply the standard deviation or anything you learn in undergraduate statistics. But quite a few programs that you use, either in the labs or later on, they will have a way to, if this is my data, they will estimate roughly how accurate your data is. Trust those programs. And any time you get a number from a colleague or something, unless they have, here's my result. A result that looks like that with one bar, it's useless, completely useless. Because there are two alternatives here, right? One of them is that the standard error is like that. The other one is that the standard error is like that. And in the first case, it's a very important result. In the second case, it doesn't tell you anything. You don't even know what the sign is. Unless there are standard, unless there are error bars on numbers, they're worthless, completely worthless. Um, and the whole point, yes, so this is basically what I'm showing, that 
this is an example of the air, uh, energy in a water simulation. And the point is that saying that delta G is minus 15 doesn't tell us anything. Minus 15 plus minus 1 tells us something. We know that it's negative, and we know roughly what the error is. And the error, the best you can hope for, either in an experiment than a simulation, is likely going to be a few kilojoules per mole. It's very hard to get free energies more accurate than that. Having said that, uh, we have calculated this a ton of times, both in simulations and experiments and everything. Uh, these are Anna, Anna Johans on its own. Oh, it is a decade ago. Time flies. So all those biological hydrophobicity scales, we've been able to understand them and confirm them just by putting not even entire helices, but just the amino acid side chains in different parts of the membrane and measure how expensive it is. And then you can say, for instance, arginine. We see that it's good to have it in the water. It's actually good to have it in the head groups too, but it's bad to have arginines in the center of the membrane. And all these curves, we can show that they correlate well with bioinformatics and everything. So with surprisingly simple simulations, we can understand fairly complicated biology. Do you see alanine on the other hand? Alanine is happy everywhere, both in the center of the membrane and in the head groups. And you can do this as complicated as you want. You can literally take an entire helix and pull it in through a translocon and measure the force as you're pushing the helix out in the membrane. People have done this since. Uh, basically, your, your imagination is the limit here. Can you try to imagine an experiment that would measure the transition state as a helix is passing out of a translocon? It's completely impossible. And simulations can do it. When I was your age, we couldn't even dream of it. Today, it might take you a month, which is certainly, you can't do it for a thousand sequences, but you can do it for a few to help us understand. So a lot of the things that I've hand-waved about and everything are actually based on that type of calculations. Uh, it might sound strange to have the study questions already here. Um, I'm not going to let you go quite yet. Um, we will talk about these tomorrow, but to prepare a little bit for this afternoon and not to leave all this strange theoretical free and just stuff hanging, I'm going to show you a little bit about how we use it in the lab. Um, so I might not cover all these slides in detail, but this is a research theme that has been going on in my team for close to a decade now. So I told you about various types of ion channels. And one of the types of ion channels that we are most interested in are the ligand-gated ones. So these are the ones that sit between nerve cells. And when you get to the end of one nerve cell, you release your neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters diffuse over one millimeter or so. And then depending on what neurotransmitter you have, they will bind to the next nerve cell and then create a new nerve impulse. I even think I have a... No, we're gonna, and what I love here is, so this is kind of halfway between physics and chemistry. You probably, you're too young. This is Sidney Harris. For a long time, he made this beautiful cartoons in Scientific Americans, jokes about science. Uh, and I think it's sad he's retired since over a decade. So where all this started, it's actually long before we had ion channels, there are a bunch of concepts that this is a fresco from Babylonia, 4,000 years old, where they're showing people smoking or drinking alcohol. And alcohol is fascinating because it's, it's a drug that it's probably the, by far the oldest drug we've had. So we've used it and abused it for four millennia. Uh, nicotine is another example. Benzodiazepines, um, rock stars. Um, what all these drugs have in common is that they actually hit the nervous system. Uh, and what I show here at the very end here, this is propofol, which is an anesthetic, which you use to sedate people in surgery. Uh, so that's quite serious business. I think I might have showed you the slides here, right? That the first surgeries you could make. This would not be possible without the drugs. At the time, we had no idea what they were actually doing. But that we do know today. So that what we are interested in is specifically the blue channels that we have down here. What happens when something binds here? And what is it that controls this through some sort of allosteric modulation? And I think I also showed you this slide already, right? That we know that there is something happening here that we're binding or changing this channel. Depending what I'm binding here and depending what channel I'm binding it to, they're either going to open or close. So it's exactly the type of process. We're, ideally, we would like to design drugs. I'm not interested in running a pharmaceutical company, but we would like to understand what happens and when we control this. What happens on Friday if you have a glass of alcohol? Why do you get this warm, fuzzy feeling? And it's, these are entirely allosteric modulators. They work just like transistors. 
a small change in the binding here will somehow create a large change in your nerve impulse. And for decades here, the entire field was fumbling in the dark because this was about as good a structure we had of them. And then the last 10 years, things have exploded. We have a number of channels, both from bacteria, worms, uh, then increasing loss from humans and mice. So suddenly, can you imagine the difference between the previous slide and suddenly we know every single binding site in these channels, we have a ton of information. So now we, with these structures, you can start designing drugs. So already when we got the first bacterial channels, uh, I had a very skilled French postdoc, uh, and he could even run simulations and show specifically where in these channels between these helices that various anesthetics and alcohol drugs bound. And he could also show how long they take. He could show the specific hydrogen bonding patterns. And at this point, we were super excited because this, you probably can't see it, but this says S267 there. It's a serine. And this serine residues has been shown to be super important. If we remove that, we completely change the sensitivity to anesthetics and alcohol. So the fact that in a simulation, we spontaneously see the molecules go there and bind if we just add ethanol out in the water. So this is, from our point of view, pretty sexy. We felt that we had understood that the binding site was, we can. It also made a whole lot of sense. It's kind of like pushing your foot through the door that we're pushing the subunits in this channel apart. And when we push them apart, that would somehow explain why the channel would open more. And we even published this. Uh, we were pretty happy. And then we went down to Paris and I talked to some colleagues at a conference and they had just pushed out a new structure. <coughs> and this is an X-ray structure and it's a type of X-ray structure that you call a co-crystal, which is, that you have the X-ray structure but you actually have a small drug bound. And I think it's desflurane in this case, or no, it's propofol. The mesh you see here is the electron density. You don't see the atoms, but again, this is a very good electron density, so it's obvious that there is some drug bound there. There was only one small problem here, and it's that I had bet the bank. All our simulations said that the drug would bind there. So this was me before the talk, and that's after. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> the reason why I'm showing you this is that we made a bunch of mistakes here, and this is a bit of memento mori. That all the simulations here were done in the bacterial channel. They were homology models. We didn't have much choice. <coughs> Sorry, the, the simulations were done on prokaryotes. The experiments was done on a different type of channel and everything. So that it's, we kind of tried to cover too much. Um, so I used the bacterial channel to try to make simulations predictions about a human channel, the glycine receptor, which is important for alcohol binding, while all the structure was for the bacterial one. So at that point, we actually took a step back and we started doing quite a lot of experiments. You will see Stephanie actually, and maybe Harsha, uh, talk a little bit about their work. And what we then do is that we take these small frog eggs where we express the channels and the, uh, they will take you through it this afternoon. And that way we can actually specifically measure in the lab what happens if I add a bit of alcohol to this channel. Does it open more or less? What if I make a mutation in the position 267? Do I get more or less current? And the way research happens, right, is that it's not by one study, but you need to make dozens or even a hundred studies. So you get lots of statistics and see how do things change depending on the mutations. And to make a long story short here, what we actually discovered is that there are some pretty important differences between the prokaryotic, the bacterial channels, and the human ones. And in particular, some of these binding sites that we had more or less by coincidence found, they're super sensitive to a mutation and this is a mutation that in the bacterium you would not have this binding site, but in the human channel we would likely have it. So it's at this point it was somewhat involuntary that we had likely found a binding site that is present in the human channels, but it's not present in the bacterial ones. And then we took those lab results and went back into the computers. And this is when Samuel started to do a lot of mutations and everything. And we actually turned out that in the simulations too, if we compare the bacterial channels, to the human channels, there are two binding sites. There's an orange binding site and there's a purple binding site. And in the bacterial channel, by default, you would only have the red binding site. But when I make the bacterial channel look like a human channel, do you see what happens? I open up a new binding site. So then we would have two places where the ion can bind. And you can actually test that in the lab too. Uh, this is all the results of very bad statistics. So in the wild type, you had binding in a few places. 
in the human one. In the bacterial one, we see very good binding. You might not see it there, but they're binding in the opposite places, actually. And if I take the bacterial channel and make it look like it's human, then I actually recover the binding that I had in these human channels. And so we're here, we started to be a bit more ecstatic because it actually, if you look at the biology of these channels, which in hindsight is a bit embarrassing, we should have done that where much earlier. It turns out that the bacterial channels are mostly shut off by at least longer chain anesthetics. By the human channels, they are rather turned on. So they have this, roughly the same channel, they are homologous, and if you have a very short chain alcohol, let's see if I had that in the previous slide. Sorry. Ah. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Don't take it literally. Um, small alcohols, methanol and ethanol, they are, even the bacterial channels are opened by them. And what happens with the longer chain alcohol, suddenly you get the opposite effect. So if it, what is the difference between ethanol and propofol, propanol? It's just one ethyl group, CH2. And instead of opening the channel, I close the channel instead. And the human channels, on the other hand, everything up to hexanol will open the channel, but the longer ones will close it. So that the hypothesis that we then developed is that it's likely based on the size of these cavities, so that one of these cavities, the red one, should then be closing the channel. While if you bind in the purple one, you should open the channel. And we managed to publish this, and it actually, it wasn't strictly true, uh, but it's largely correct. There are definitely separate binding sites, and depending on the specific channel we have, we can open one or the other. The memento mori here, too, is that just this entire department, we love to work with prokaryotes. Prokaryotes are outstanding. They're great model systems. They frequently have roughly the same properties. I can overexpress any prokaryotic uh, protein in a matter of, well, not days, but weeks at least. It's easy to express prokaryotic channels. Eukaryotes, everything is an order of magnitude more complicated. So it's obvious to make the assumptions that use the eukaryotes as model systems. But there is one assumption there. Start by checking that they actually behave the, right, the same way. Because this is not limited to these. Areas. There are tons of channels that don't behave the same way in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. But at this point, we still had this nagging feeling that this was a bit of hand-waving and everything. What made us super happy, though, was after we had published these studies, about a year later, there was another channel. It's a much higher organism. It's essentially a human. OK, it's a worm. Um, but it, compared to bacterium, it's essentially a human. To first order approximation. <laughs> and this. Right, it had a molecule bound. So this is ivermectin, which is an uh, antiparasitic agent. Uh, and this molecule is bound in exactly the same place where we had predicted that eukaryotic channels could bind things. And the point is that we had made these predictions before they published the structures. So I'm not saying that the experience simulations are always right, but they are increasingly, we are increasingly doing our research in the computers and then confirming them in the lab. And at this point, we wanted to show that we can actually do proper prediction. Uh, so what we would like to do, can we take one of these channels and can we take a channel that is normally, say, turned off by a molecule and change the channel itself so that the same channel is instead enabled by the anesthetic? So what, this is a typical desflurane, if I recall correctly, small anesthetic, uh, volatile. And if we take a wild type of the bacterial channels, we know that these channels would be turned off by the anesthetic. And we had a rough idea where some of them bind because there are crystal structures of desflurane. But let's not assume that too much. Uh, remember what I said, so why on earth would I, this is just a wild type, the crystal structure. I know that things bind there. But I wanted to test these two different binding sites. There was one binding site inside each subunit and one binding site between the subunits. So the one inside we call intra subunit and the one between is inter subunit. And the one inside the subunit, this is where I have things bound in the crystal structure even. So why on earth would I dock to something where I know the result? So here we literally did high throughput screening, but just for one molecule. I want to say, where does this fluorine bind. So why would I even ask where this fluorine binds? 
if I know where it binds. So this is my positive test, right? If I had predicted in this case that this drawing binds here, there is something wrong because I know that it should bind there. And I get it roughly right. I think there was one of this group that fluorine was a turn, maybe a quarter of a turn or something. But for all intents and purposes, it's awesome. I do predict that it will bind where I know that it will bind, which gives me some reasonable confidence that the docking should be able to capture the properties both of my entire protein in a membrane. It's a fairly complicated setup. Docking in membrane proteins is far more complicated than docking a water-soluble protein, which is why most people haven't done it. And then I also take the same molecule but force to dock it between these subunits. And you can almost see that here, that there's a large phenylalanine ring in this case, and they're going to overlap. That's going to be a very bad energy. They will hate to be there. And then I take exactly the same molecule but mutate that phenylalanine ring to something small, like an alanine. I literally remove the entire ring. And then I do the same thing here. I dock it and say that what are the positions you can bind in inside each subunit and what are the positions you can bind in between the subunits. And that doesn't tell me anything because here is the problem with docking. What docking is going to tell you is that yes, you can bind there. If, if you're going to bind here, you're going to bind in that post. If you're going to bind there, you can bind in that post, but that appears to be pretty bad. Here you can bind either there or there. So docking basically just says yes or no. And we said yes, no, yes, yes. Is yes better than yes? <laughs> or is the third yes better than the second yes? Yes is better than no, right? But it's, only, it's unlikely to be in the no state. How much better is yes than no? And this is where docking fails. Docking is not going to get you a delta G. So it's, I'm not saying that no does not mean that it will never happen, I will eat my left chew. Just no just means that it's not quite as good as yes. And quite as good as that, does that mean one in 10, one in 100, or one in a billion? And to answer that, we need to calculate the free energy. But the, the reason why you need the docking is that now we have a pose. We have four poses. We have the wild type inside and between subunits, and we have the mutant inside and between subunits. So there are four things I want to test. Oops, sorry. And I'm not going to go through the details exactly how you do that in a simulation. So there is lots of data on this plot, but it's fairly. Let's. We use exactly the thing I told you about before the break. We calculate what is the free energy of binding desflurane in a specific binding pose between the subunits in the wild type. And then I do this. I said between now, right? so the other one would be inside. So there are four different things I want to, in practice it's much more than four, but I'm, I will ignore that for now. Look at the, let's start by looking at the black bars there. Ignore, pretend you don't see the orange ones. So this is a molecule called this fluorine, and we're only going to look at those two black bars. And negative is good binding, so that is roughly minus 22 kilojoules per mole. Do you see the arrow bars? Do you trust the results? So the arrow bars are reasonably small here, right? Now, there are some caveats here. Those error bars only describe the sampling when I calculate my free energy. They don't describe the quality of the homology model. So there are, you should always be aware that any error bar, almost any error bars from any calculations, they are lower bounds. They can, always, they can only be larger in practice because there, there are always errors we don't account for or the quality of the parameters or so. So which place is better to bind in, inside the subunit or between the subunits? So it's going to be better, but what's the difference? So minus 22 kilojoules per mole and say minus 14 kilojoules per mole. The point is that both of them are good, right? So you're going to see binding in both places. So if you start by adding one molecule, you're first going to bind them. There are five subunits, sub so that you will first add five molecules here, and eventually when you've saturated this binding site, you might start to bind there too. So both of them are good, but this one is better. The relative occupancy of these two states you can calculate from the Boltzmann distribution. It's that simple. But you will definitely, I wouldn't do that in this case, uh, so we definitely prefer to bind inside each subunit. That made sense because that's what we saw in the wild type that if you made the co-crystal, we found the anesthetic bound inside each subunit. Uh, 
So, and again, check, check, check. Trust, but verify. So we verified that we predicted the place where we predicted it would be best is also the place where we saw it when colleagues of us determined the structure. And that also agreed with our hypothesis that this binding site inside the subunit should be the binding site that shut, off, shut the channel off, that we would inhibit the channel from binding there. Everything makes sense. But then we look at the orange bars. So the orange bars is exactly the same binding in the wild type. Do you see what has happened? I don't change that binding that much, right? It's a little bit worse. But this binding is becoming way better. And now the problem is that the difference between the two error orange bars here are smaller, but it's certainly outside of the standard error estimates there. So what do we predict would happen in the wild type? Uh, sorry, not wild type, uh, mutant, my bad. So what we're saying in this F238A mutant, we would predict that they would start by binding between the subunits instead of inside each subunit. And our hypothesis that, that that binding site would have the opposite property, right? That it would open the channel instead. And then we, the problem with doing this for one molecule, it's noisy. So we actually tried another molecule, chloroform here too, which is another small anesthetic. And qualitative, actually the results are even stronger for chloroform. But you see the qualitatively the same effect. That's also a very common point in science that don't just use one molecule, do it for five or ten molecules and <coughs> look at the patterns. So based on these results, this was entirely computational. What do you predict would happen in the lab? So I said, in the wild type, if I added this anesthetic, I shut off the channel. So what would happen in the mutant now if we add anesthetic to the mutant channel? It would open it, and it does. So that all these different, and here's the point, you see there are quite a lot of fluctuations for different types of anesthetics here, but for all of them in the mutant, they turn on the channel instead. So you reverse the problem, it's even a super strong effect, so that it's, when you go for lower concentration, you get a super strong opening instead of inhibition. Real life is more complicated than that, because if you thought it was complicated with two binding sites, we actually realize there is a third binding site. You can also bind in the pore, and part of the inhibition actually happens in the pore. So, and to make it more complicated than this, all these channels, they're also, they have bimodal effects, meaning that <coughs> normally if you add a little bit of something, and you get an effect. If you add twice as much chemical, you would expect the effect to be twice as strong, right? or you would affect to be stronger at least. What frequently happens with these channels is that the effect, the sign of the effect is concentration dependent. So if you give it a little low concentration or something, you turn it on, and then as you increase the concentration, suddenly the effect starts to go down, and if you increase the concentration even more, you shut off the channel. So it's not just the slope of the curve that varies, but even the sign will vary dependent on the concentration. Can you guess why that happens? Oh, sorry. This. Can you guess why that happens? If you look at these curves. Yes. So what what might happen here, right? You start to bind in this black site. And that is definitely the best site. And that's the site that would turn the channel, actually the yellow, th this one might be better. So you would start by binding between the subunits and that would open the channel. But you only have five such binding sites. And at some point in time, all those five sites are occupied. And as you add even more anesthetic, the anesthetic will also start to bind inside each subunit. But the effect here will be the opposite. So now as you're increasing the concentration even more, you start to take the effect down. And at some point, this might even be a stronger. Most of you have probably tried that at some point. So what happens when you take one glass of wine? Or two? You feel a bit aroused, right? If you start drinking 10 glasses of wine, you become tired. So that these effects are concentration dependence. And alcohol is included here. Uh, it's slightly more complicated for anesthetics and everything, but, but this is one of the reasons why neuropharmacology is so cool. Uh, 
it's all these th normal things about binding and everything don't apply. It's multiple binding sites, it's concentration dependent. It's super complicated. Um, so there is uh, there's room for 50 more carriers. Uh, the other things you can do with these potential of mean force, you can actually measure how expensive it is to pull an ion through this ion channel. And the reason for that is that then we measured the transition state here, right? Then we can measure what, how quickly will ions be able to move through the channel. And then you can do this once if the channel does not have anything bound under when we expect it to be closed. And then we have a fairly large barrier. And then we add the glutamate, the neurotransmitter here. And then we would expect the channel to be open. And you can actually show that once you have an open channel with this bound, there is still a barrier, but it's much lower. So then the channel is actually open. So we can use computers quite accurately actually to predict what happens. Will the channel open and close? and suddenly it will conduct ions. If you thought that was complicated, we just worked on one specific channel here that was also a homopentamer. So it's five <coughs> identical subunits. I might have mentioned this too, but I didn't show you the slide. Um, one of the most famous channels in the nerve system is the GABA channel. And we can even, there have been a few structures of this, and then it's been a homopentamer. The important GABA channel has both alpha and beta subunits. And again, I think I mentioned this to you that the interface from beta to alpha, this is where the anesthetics will bind to sedate you. If you change this binding site, you can create mice that you can't sedate with anesthetics. If you think that was complicated, the most common one in your body is actually has both alpha, beta, and the gamma subunits. The order by which you assemble this is also going to matter. If you think that was complicated, there are delta subunits in the channel too. They're not that common, uh, but they, they definitely occur. Uh, these are just the major subunits. For each of these subunits, you have different genotypes. Uh, so there are, s there are like six slightly different genes for the alpha subunits, three different ones for the beta, three different ones for gamma, and then delta, epsilon, theta, and phi subunits. All of these genes are expressed in your brains. And exactly why and how, we don't know that. There are some very weak sequence differences. between. There are small things. They're, of course, important. Otherwise, you wouldn't have 17 different genes. But exactly what they do, your bet is as good as mine. Really interesting research here for the future. Generations, both on sequencing, actually. One thing, I'm, I'm, I'm done, but I'm just going to say one other thing. One thing that we think should happen, that, but that we don't know is that when it comes to addiction disease in general, it may somehow makes sense that the expression level the body uses should vary here. So that what if normally this channel is, ex normally you don't have that much ethanol in your bodies, say in a nonamolar or something. And then you have a stable normal cellular response. Remember that I mentioned when the ethanol is present, you tend to stimulate the response, so we get a stronger response. So what if you regularly drink alcohol so that you always say have 100 millimolar, well 100 millimolar you would be dead, but, uh, <laughs> but you always have one millimolar alcohol in your blood. Eventually the cells will likely start to downregulate these genes because you have too much response. You don't want that much response. And you have the alcohol taking care of it anyway. So then your cells will likely downregulate certain genes here and things are going to work just fine as long as you continue to drink lots of alcohol. And we don't know that, I wish that we could prove this, but we haven't. Um, so there have been a couple of large scale studies where people have tried to find differences in expression patterns, and that has to do with transcriptomics. Um, and in particular, looking at people with addiction disease, do they have different expression patterns? Uh, and I'm, it's inconclusive this far. But the reason why this is important is that we know today that many of these withdrawal syndromes uh, they are physical. We, historically, we've thought of them as psychic uh, related, but it's not. That you, can, you can actually die from withdrawal syndromes if they're severe enough. So what likely happens is that you are in this situation where you've downregulated all these genes and suddenly you stop drinking alcohol, which of course long term is very good for you, but short term you have a nervous system response that is only one tenth of what it should be. And you, you're, you're going to be physically ill from this. Not from not thinking alcohol, right? Because but your nerves don't respond the way they should. And then, of course, eventually, if you do this slowly, will, your cells will hopefully upregulate this again. Uh, 
and what we then think. But again, we don't know. Likely, the difference in expression between all these subgenes is likely what explains why you have different cells in different parts of your brain, in your spine, in your hypothalamus, and everything. But we have no idea about the details. And this starts going and being related to brain uh, research. But the, oh, brain and neuropharmacology and neurochemistry is, in my somewhat <coughs> biased point of view, some of the coolest research we're going to do in the next 10 years. Three minutes past noon. Uh, let's finish there, and then we'll meet those of you who want at 2 p.m. at SciLife Lab.